a car! All right, fellas, steady. A little to the left. Oh, careful now. I'm gonna fall. Keep climbing. And you, get that light out of my eyes. That's it, that's it. All right, a little to the left, a little more. All right, to the right. Yeah, there you go. All right, a little to the middle. I don't know what direction it is. Then just a little to the end. All right. Well, was it him? Well, I'm just curious as to whether or not it was him. I hate being left in the dark, you know. I guess we can assume that it wasn't him, right? Let's get back to work. Sorry for that little interruption. Hi, everybody. I'd like to welcome you. Hi, everybody. How are you today? Great. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm Tina Price. I have the pleasure of being able to achieve this man's vision who wanted to bring you all together. So with a further ado, please find a seat if you're a pro and you worked on the, on the crew. Find a seat up front here. We've got boom mics that are going to be picking up. We're zooming out. We have an audience in, and we have a 360 camera. We have a 360 camera here, so anybody wearing a headset is in the middle. So well, we're covered. Wow, <laughs> we're fully covered. So you are being watched at all times. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know. Watch that finger. Watch that There's finger. There's no bad seat in the house. All right. With further ado, Jerry, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Tina. Well, it's a absolute joy to gather here with the, the cast and crew of the brave little toaster uh gosh back in 1985 we started this and at the time it was just we were starving to do something creative and we wound up doing this independent thing that was just pirate and crazy and looking back over the years having done so many different things that are more standard and and innovative this stands out as just something that warms my heart and it has meaning for me and evidently for so many other people. We keep getting feedback and certainly our cast and crew have remained connected in such a vibrant way. It sort of surpasses any other experience I've had. So we're gonna do a couple chapters here. I'm gonna take people down memory lane uh, with some pictures of behind the scenes. And as people get uh, stories occur to them, they wanna join in, uh, we can have conversation with that. And then we're gonna take a break after a while. And when we come back, we are gonna start with a video from Steve Siegel uh, that shows behind the scenes, uh, it was the only behind the scenes footage that was shot of uh, working in Taiwan together during that phase. And then, then we'll open up to just questions and answers, anything that you have on your mind. But uh, this first phase is more about us going down memory lane together and just jogging memories. So here we go. Okay, you can turn the screen over to me there. Okay, cool, there's, <laughs> here we are. I will just do a, a quick head count of who is here. So we have Deanna, who was voice of the toaster. <laughs> and 
man, David Newman. <laughs> we have Christina Newman, assistant to the <laughs> Susie Allenson Williams, who was our <laughs> vocal instructor, singing coach, singing microwave, and singing sports car. So a lot of credits there. We have Roger Freeland, who was a singer on Worthless, singer on B Movie, singer on Cutting Edge. Hey, Roger. We have James Byhold, layout artist and, and fencing champion. And a fencing champion, by the way, which I was not aware of. Yes. Randy Cartwright, directing animator. <laughs> We have Kirk Hansen, layout artist. Alex Mann, storyboard artist, layout artist. Brian McEntee, art director, layout supervisor, screen story. We have Rob Minkoff, character designer and model for Master Rob. Do the little glasses thing and people will see that it's you. We have Steve Moore, animator and developmental animator. Rebecca Reese, directing animator, developmental animator, assistant animator supervisor. Chuck Richardson, production supervisor, additional voices and additional visual effects. Wore many hats. Daryl Rooney, storyboard artist, layout artist, this is the layout supervisor. I, I think he is in route from another gig and will be running in soon. So I think we will see him shortly. Yes, he's double booked, of course. We have Steve Siegel, scene planner. Chris Wall, animator, layout artist, additional layout supervisor. Stephen Wall, layout artist. <laughs> Kirk Wise, developmental animator. And me, Jerry Reese, and uh, we're, we're a few hats. <laughs> Steve, Steve Moore. Steve Moore. Uh, you did this yesterday, didn't you, David? Yeah. So, a uh, little uh, thoughts about where the characters are now. <laughs> Poor Kirby. It's so true. <laughs> that, that hard life. Yeah. That's right. It turned out the master was uh, a toxic narcissist. Right. <laughs> and then uh, Daryl Rooney sent me something. He also was inspired. He went another direction. And Deanna, you might read the dialogue that's coming up here. All right. And as toaster, Although I think that's a good representation of yes. me at this point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this, this is toaster. He went, What if it's not the brave little toaster? It's the brave little AI toaster. So he did this. Would you like me to warm up your toast? Or would you like me to kill everyone and take over the world? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, please know. <laughs> Uh, Toaster did uh, sort of invade our lives recently in an unexpected way. Here's, here's when it happened. This was also Steve was behind us. Oh, that cake. Happy birthday to <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yes. 
So it takes me back to, we actually have the original painting of this. Uh, I always love this moment where they're just settling down for the night. Just a few thoughts. Uh, we only had two and a quarter million dollars for all 90 minutes of our film. Uh, so at the time, like Care Bears was seven, I think Booth was 12, Disney was 25 million. So we were the cheapest thing going. Uh, every day, our animators had to accomplish what would have taken two weeks at Disney. It's pretty daunting. Come to you and say like, you know, your next two weeks plan, end of today. <laughs> That's pretty hard. But the most creative freedom we ever had, still to this day, we cared for each other and for our characters. And we were not product makers, we were storytellers. So. And just something that warmed my heart is letters, emails, and drawings from fans have been heartwarming evidence of the connection. Uh, Mark McKinsey and his now wife, Lisa, uh, God, it was years ago, we were in touch for entirely other reasons, and he just discovered that I had done Toaster. So he wrote this, I asked him if I could put this on my website, and he said yes. So he wrote, I had no idea you were the director of the old Disney classic, The Brave Little Toaster. Dude, I grew up watching that movie. It was one of my favorites. Makes me wanna grab a copy for old time's sakes. Sheesh, I still have vivid imagery of that movie now and I'm sure there was some deep meaning behind that movie that I can somehow remember. <laughs> Never letting go of what you love most, no matter what it takes. If I remember. So, They've now been uh, married for a year, few years and have two little kids that are growing up. And uh, there's just, we get drawings from people. There's so many. Uh, ben Cross is somebody that's been in touch, uh, sending notes and, and art for a long time. Uh, Andrew Ald does videos and uh, I just grabbed a frame from one of his videos. You can look those up. Uh, Kira Devani, she's just painted this one recently and uh, sent that image to me. Uh, Harriet Wong did this beautiful piece that she handed to us a few weeks ago, and it's on display here. And she is here today, and she brought a whole bunch more art with her today. So there will be a lot more stuff on display. And uh, I don't know who did this. It was on DeviantArt. I absolutely love it. I'm sure maybe somebody here knows who that was. And there's this guy who's uh, constantly the cosplay guy, right? Wow. <laughs> He's great. I see him everywhere. I did find out how to get a note to him and told him thanks. And uh, Teresa Dindy, we met her out in Arizona a while back. And so I got to see her amazing toaster car. It's entirely, everything is about toast. <laughs> Look at that engine. It's just amazing. And I got to, I got to pretend to drive it. I, I think, Carol, you got to ride in the car, right? And she even sent me two books. There was The Adventures of Toaster. And there was the uh, Further Adventures of Toaster. So it was a sequel. <laughs> and uh, and I, I caught Toaster like sneaking around our backyard too. Uh, I'll just, I'm going to do a, a little bit of reading of a review. This was back when we first came out. And uh, it was from David Edelstein. And I, I just thought he really understood what we were doing. So many people misinterpreted, wasn't, weren't sure what we were up to. So I'll just read this. Uh, the Brave Little Toaster is one of the loveliest full-length cartoons ever made, a buoyant and sometimes melancholy ode to the gizmos that once meant more to us than, as grown-ups, we can unblushingly explain. It's not a dazzler the way Fantasia or Pinocchio or even the techno wonder who framed Roger Rabbit are. It's old-fashioned, low-tech, but the point of the movie, which is based on a novella by Thomas Dish, is that simple, outdated objects can absorb and reflect so much more of our souls than our new, their newfangled upgrades can. In the picture spell, we turn to a state when the world was er, pre-user friendly. This is a universe where our most beloved possessions have distinct personalities and needs. The strongest link about the toaster, blanket, radio, lamp, and vacuum cleaner in a country cabin is the love they share for the little boy, the master, who arrives every summer to play with them. The look of the characters is rarely more complicated than your average Hanna-Barbera cartoon. They have broad lines and big round eyes and black marble pupils, but they're mobile emotionally. There's nothing cartoonish about their hearts. By the end, we know them well, their quirks, their moods, their pet peeves, the stalwart toaster who acts as the peacemaker, gestures with his black handles, 
so that in bringing forth a piece of perfect toast, he seems to throw up his arms in ecstasy. <laughs> the needy blanket, always wanting to cuddle, enfolds itself in hastily fashioned arms and mews adorably. The lamp is nice and dim and sounds like a Muppet. <laughs> the curmudgeonly vacuum cleaner Kirby has a bass voice that's instantly familiar as the one that sang the songs in How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Maybe the best of all, it's the wise guy radio, brilliantly played by John Lovitz, who provides a constant spew of 30s and 40s oral memorabilia. Game shows, speeches, slogans, famous sports broadcasts. He calls the brave little toaster slats. <laughs> the director, Jerry Reese, is a real filmmaker. It's odd to speak of camera angles, since technically speaking, there aren't any. Everything is drawn. But Reese has storyboarded the film as if the toaster and its comrades were actors instead of cartoons and lo, they become so. So, so uh, how it all began, let's just uh, jump in and I'm gonna race through these. I have far too many pictures, but uh, if any, it brings back memories for anybody. Oh, Rebecca, there you are. Oh, I'm the you can't. I've seen them. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we, you know, our, we were in uh, McCadden Place in Hollywood and uh, out the window, was bricks. So if you look at that, that, that was the view out the window. So uh, that was not a prop, it was a real, real building. Uh, Brian with working away. And uh, Joe Ramp coming to visit in the room where I had uh, Joe. He was, uh, he was our soulmate uh, during that whole thing and just a magical person. And we miss him every day. So he came in to visit uh, very often. I, you can see my ancient uh, K-Pro computer there, one of the first uh, mobiles back in, this was 80, 85. Uh, Daryl Rooney coming to visit. And uh, Chuck, we're planning something there. <laughs> right. And uh, Ann Talnis working with us there. She is now a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, political cartoonist, I believe. So. And there's Alex. I got a lot of pictures of you, Alex. Working away. So great. There was, you know, Alex and Joe and Daryl Rooney and I boarded the whole film. There's Daryl. I was never late for work. Sorry. <laughs> Those Pull up a chair. Those were early days. It's not much on the walls. Yes. Oh, th this was uh, 85. We were just getting started. Yeah. First few weeks. So, Daryl, your pictures are just coming up. You got here just in time. But Alex, you're looking very cool with the shades, I must say. <laughs> uh, yeah. Charming as can be. And then uh, coming up, I have a picture of you and Joe. I just love this. You guys work together constantly. Constantly. And I, I, there's some little notes. I can't quite read them. The resolution isn't enough, but it's notes that we made back and forth to each other. Uh, look at how young those kids are. Kirk <laughs> and Kevin and, and uh, Kevin Lima. Have you seen these children? <laughs> it's past 10 o'clock. It like this now. You know what you're talking yeah. about. You know, the yeah, future co-director of the Beauty and the Beast and future director of the Goofy movie sitting together. There's Anne. <laughs> Chris, you need to sleep. still Anne. And uh, there we were gathered together in the, uh, the brick building. <coughs> Daryl, there you are. Looking very, very suave. It looks like you're drawing the, the meadow scene. Yeah, you can see some, and Joe working away there. Were the, the Let's pads that. tear away? They were, you'd tear them, right? Then were they perforated? We, we just kind of would, I, I, when I drew, I was just draw straight down and cut paper and oh, okay. just tape them together. There was no like real. Going down. Just yeah, around. we kept just moving them around. Yeah. Um, you can see our cool digs. We had the yeah, hole, the hole of the rats would re peek through the ceiling there. They actually did that. That we had we had rats trying to to vie for the the bagels in the morning. We, we had those actual rat holes like you see in cartoons, yeah. like in the walls. <laughs> You'd see the rat hole down by the floorboards. Complete with a little 
welcome mat. Yeah. 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 A tiny little bed and a tiny radio. <laughs> Did you guys remember uh, uh, seeing the rats on the table in the morning and sort of saying something about it? And they were the. I, I, I never heard any. Uh, oh, yes, rat prints. Rat prints on the drawing. They were saying they were in the meadow sequence. Tanya. Yay. Tanya, I, if you're, you're watching, Tanya said she was going to watch. We celebrate you, Tanya. We wish you were here. We miss you. John Norton. There's uh, James Byhold working away. There you are. You're very studious. And uh, there you are together. Not, not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin working away again. And uh, Tim Hauser was doing, I, I was so hoping he would be here today. Tim is another one that's almost made it. And uh, he was doing the Star Trek theme. And he was doing the, the, the like the high pitched, like female voices. Oh. <laughs> and somewhere I still have that tape. <laughs> I have to find it. So entertainment uh, behind the scenes. There you guys are. Yeah, it's it was it was the bricks. It, we were telling him that that was uh, that was not a prop. That was a real building right next to our window. Randy. Now, Randy, you had, you had already like what ten years under your belt at Disney when you jumped in. Yeah, I was seventy five. I started there. So about, so yeah, about ten years, I guess. Yeah. 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 He was kind of, he was kind of a one old man. <laughs> Actually, I, I uh, moved to Japan first and worked on Little Nemo and Slumberland for a couple of oh, years. Oh, right. Nice. Then got married uh, <laughs> to my Jim, wife. Oh, you're, you're the so. reason our battery is the Google battery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, um, uh, Joe's wife, uh, Sue, was supposed to manage paying all the bills for the apartments and right. electricity and stuff like that. But as soon as we got there, she hurt her back seriously. Oh, that's right. yeah, yeah, and she couldn't do a thing. So Junko had to take over and do that job. <coughs> the thing is, the people in Taiwan, of course, speak Chinese, and of course, we speak English. She speaks Japanese, right. <laughs> and she knew some English, and she had studied some Chinese in high school. But she had to translate between Chinese and oh, English, right. <laughs> and neither right. of which was her original language. Right. Yeah. But that's a, quite a task, and we also had uh, three, I think, three translators constantly yeah. at the studio overseas as well. Yeah. So, and who's dead in the background? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> you, usually for about an hour that, after lunch. Yeah. Yeah. That pose was pretty much all over the studio. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jerry, I think you called Randy our one old man. He's channeling Kimball. It was a much smaller right studio, so we didn't need nine. Now, Rob, <laughs> in, in addition to doing uh, character design, it's galore. <laughs> Do you, did you were you very aware that we were just well, designing you for the I movie? Remember, no, I think I I remember this very clearly is that Steve animated a, a scene, maybe the first or second scene, and you said that you had him pushing up his glasses, which was something I had like those giant nineteen th those yeah. are smaller glasses than I had in nineteen eighty five. I had yeah. like giant. Yeah things and they would just always slip down my face and so I was constantly <laughs> pushing them up. And the other thing that I remember you saying is that I walked in a particular peculiar way which was that my heel somehow didn't leave the ground uh or left at the ground late is that am i making that up I, anyway. <laughs> so so that was where so, but that was before i think you decided to name the character rob yeah and then i had definitely decided to name him rob because of you and we picked up your mannerisms and i went oh he's he's alive for me now so there you go so you 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 brought did more than just design that character. You embodied the character. So, yeah. and uh, to visit Tony Anselmo visiting, that was great. And uh, Alex, we're we're planning something here. Yes, we are. I'm not sure what we're we're doing. Something serious. <laughs> there, I think I'm I'm drawing uh, the scene where the picture broke, and the air conditioner is going to start spewing cold air on them and having a confrontation so uh thanks to brian and chuck for getting these black and white pictures by the way um you know i recently went through and scanned a whole bunch like 2820 
original individual storyboard panels for the Brave Little Toaster, but I could not find a few. So I couldn't find this sep separate versions of these. So I, at least I have, check your picture you got of the whole panel of the opening sequence that I did for the, for the film. Do you have a guess how many there were altogether? I, you know, I, right now I have about, about 80% of the film. I'm missing a couple of entire sequences. So City of Light is missing. Most of the swamp is missing. But 2,820 uh, is about 80% of the film. So I'm guessing all told it's like 3,500 to 4,000, something like that. Um, here we have uh, something that was happening in that building at McCadden Place uh, as we started to design the characters, try to move them around. So here's a bit of experimental animation uh, pencil tests. And Rebecca and Steve and uh, Kirk, and you'll see everybody's names at the top of the frame while the scenes play. And most of the time, the camera operators uh, spelled my name wrong. So. <laughs> you'll see in this slide. You know, this, it was such an essential thing to build what the, how the characters would move, how they would be themselves. Uh, you know, Rebecca, your thing of the, of the plug being used as a, as a hand, it made so much sense that you have this, you know, this character that basically had no appendages, and, you know, just a, a neck. But using that was a great solution. And uh, once we established those rules, everybody else in the team could get ready to use those for, for all the characters. Uh, then why, why we started writing dialogue and laying it out and uh, got in the recording booth. And so here we all are 
Deanna, there you are bringing toaster to life. Looking very serious and then getting into the routine there. Oh. <laughs> I'm looking at you. There's a uh, Tim recording the Tim stack recording Lampy and and also Zeke, the customer that comes in. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, was wondering yeah. if you got some radio tunes. <laughs> and and to, by the way, he sent a note this morning. He was trying to make it today. Uh, couldn't at the last minute. He's on a gig, uh, but he sent a very nice note this morning. It says hi to you all. And uh, John Lovitz, uh, Rebecca and I were just going through Vegas and his billboard was up. He's booked right now. So we uh, had a little exchange with him, uh, wishing him good luck and he's wishing us. Gosh, it's just so much fun. We, we, by the way, later we could talk more about it if people want, but uh, we had to do an entire marathon recording session for all of his lines in one session. Uh, John's recording for the entire feature was one endless session. Was it because he had the Saturday Night Live right. gig? He was just booked on Saturday Night Live and his agent said, sorry, he's out of here. And so I called John and pled with him. He says, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And then he came back and, <laughs> and uh, so we, he, we had one day. And uh, that is a whole story in and of itself, but he survived, but it was, it was a big adventure, I'll tell you. And it had a middle chapter where we didn't know if it was gonna happen. He pulled through and we got everything. Then I sat in with you guys to feed his lines as my faux radio to, to do ensemble scenes. And that eventually gave birth to me singing the radio parts uh, at David's insistence when uh, we, we had him gone, so. And then, uh, Going over and it's great to have Joe hanging out with us and inspiring everyone and there's Thurl Ravenscroft and Susie there you are helping us uh, get everything right as usual. And oh man he was just uh, what a treat I just I, I was so used to Thurl's voice from so many sources all over Disneyland and and uh, you know of course the, the Grinch and everything but I remembered him from like the you know Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack, and he's one of the singing heads in the Haunted Mansion. Tony the, Tony the Tiger. That was the last thing I knew. It's like I knew all the other Disney references, and then somebody said Tony the Tiger. Oh, said that's Tiki right. Room? Tiki Room. Tiki Room. Yeah. Tiki Room. Yeah. And Prince Buff the Buffalo Head, and, and Country Bear Jamboree, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and Voice on Train, etc. And he had great stories for David. Here we are, mixing and listening, and then uh, you know. Chuck and David and Susie and and uh, and I would just sit and listen to his stories. He just had amazing stories with Walt and with Elvis Presley and on and on. Uh, Timothy E. Day, great, wonderful kid actor, and we used to call him One Take Timmy because he just would nail it. And he he would want to know his motivation, and uh, he would ask, and then he would deliver. And I have not been able to find out where he is. I've really have done diligent searching and was trying to reach out to see if he might participate in something like this. I can't find him right now. Uh, well, I've been trying for about five years to find out where he is. Did he act afterwards? I cannot find anything. But you know, his mom, so it was the sweetest thing. She was the opposite of a stage parent. She just said he would see kids acting and stuff and said, I, I think I can do that. And could you please call some people? And so she goes, ah, I, I just tried and you guys liked him. So I mean, he just drove him here. So she would just sit quietly in the back and he would do his thing and we all just loved him. So uh, Phil Hartman doing uh, his wonderful air conditioner and he also did the uh, Peter Lorre lamp too. But here's a little time travel with, uh, with him. I just thought this was great. This is another audio piece. Here to be. Give a careful look and listen to this cartoon. Somebody untie the knot in this guy's cord. Why don't you just shut up? Hey, I'm real scared there, Kirby. What are you gonna do, suck me to death? You probably think that the air conditioner's voice is Jack Nicholson's, right? Well, that's what we thought until we checked it out. It actually is the voice of this man, Saturday Night Live co-star Phil Hartman. My best impressions are the ones that are in a similar timber, for example, uh, Jack Benny has always been one of my best. And you see, Jack Benny is sort of in the same place as Jack Nicholson. It's that kind of edge in the back of your throat. You know something? You're a real bright little lamp. 
the character of the air conditioner gets very emotional, and Jack Nich Nicholson is very funny when he gets angry. He, uh, he's so overblown and crazy, you know. Uh, so I, I think it worked well. Uh, Judy Toll uh, also participated. Uh, I think Mindy, Sterling and Judy Toll were the two parts of the sewing machine. They argued with each other. Oh, it was brilliant the way they improv improvised that. Joe, uh, I so loved giving him his first official role, speaking role as Elmo St. Peter's. Uh, you know, we would all, when people would come through to potentially invest in our film, we would pitch storyboards. And so we'd take turns getting up and doing voices and entertaining and I'd shove the board out of the way, Joe would come up and do stuff. And I just loved when he would do his almost St. Peter's. And so I said, do the final. He said, really? So it was just great having him do that. He really put his whole heart into it. And uh, <laughs> it's just great. And uh, Wayne Katz is the, the uh, Rob voice. So it's your voice. And uh, call it Savage or Chris. And uh, I sang for the radio and did a couple squirrels and did the megaphone and stuff like that. A couple of squirrels. Yeah. yeah. Hey, fellas, come here, look at this. Um, and then jailbreak the, uh, the megaphone, etc. Uh, the storyboards, it was just great how what we would do in those quick little intention sketches and the storyboards would really follow through to the final and just it was great to see the you know because we, when we were boarding we would put the intention of the performance mainly and take a, a commit to the cinema but really committing to the the acting that would happen in the middle of that cinematic choice and boy did uh, the final just follow everything beautifully and uh also if some people had asked so i quickly threw in uh People had asked if we had more model sheets, and I we did find some. So this morning, I just grabbed these shots uh, folder, and so you could see some of the characters that we have. I'll do more proper things later on, but just some of the the poses, the attitudes of all the different characters. So there's many, many of those available for people to see later on when we get get our act together and scan them properly. Hey, Gary, uh, I yes. found uh, I brought some some. Uh, Incidental characters I found. Oh, I had a whole bunch of them. Looked like Kevin had designed them. Excellent stuff. Oh. I'd forgotten I had like <clears throat> you know one scene little characters. Yeah, that's great. Did you do you want to bring them out now, or bring them out later on? <laughs> <laughs> I could just jump to my, the next part of my thing. I'd rather see your stuff. All right. So I'll just jump to my next chapter here while you get those out. Yeah, we have. Computer. Quadruped. Quadruped. Does he actually have a name, or did we just call him that internally? Oh, there you go. Oh, you can show him. Yeah, yeah. I, I show and tell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, quadruped. You remembered your scene. We have quadruped. Oh, yeah. 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 We got uh, Chris. What did she start? Chris. Yes, yes. Who was her big inspiration? Was there an inspiration for Chris? No, no. Oh, no I own this. Grunge, <laughs> grungy television. Do you remember? Yes. Yep. Who was grungy television? I don't even remember this character. It was in uh, B movies. Yeah, yeah. B movies. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. devil. Yeah, I remember growing up designing it. Here's Jerry's guy. Jailbreak. 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 Refrigerator. Excellent. You know, you got to design a refrigerator if you're going to put it in the movie, right? Get it around. <laughs> but this refrigerator had no face for some reason. I guess you had to open the door, maybe. Side. Electric pencil sharpener. Mm. What's that? <laughs> this device is an electric pencil sharpener. Too. What's a pencil? I think this is one of the supposed high tech ones. I. What's oh, this? Hot air corn popper. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those were state of the art. Yeah, that was in the apartment, I think. Oh, here's Master. Rob poses. Did you do those, Randy? I don't think so. I'm getting the storyboard. 
Oh yeah, even during the during the journey, how the chair would be the radio chair travel. and battery. Battery would be strapped chair. to the chair. This is the explaining how that whole thing is put the together. Junco battery, right? The Junco battery, yes. <laughs> then there's Young Master. There he is. Yeah, it does kind of look like Kevin's. He hasn't changed yeah, this, much. this looks like Kevin's. Definitely his handwriting. Yeah, sometimes Rob, I was, uh, sometimes I was going, yeah. Kevin or you, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy Ernie, who didn't make the cut. But, but I did find the storyboards for that second, so. Apparently, I, I found, I had some poses, I don't know, of them. I, I don't know what they were from, but they're not, I don't think they're in here. Here's the lamp that answers uh, the door when they go to the. The house, the well, apartment. Jim, Jim Jackson, Jim Jackson. Another, another guy from the big, oh. big boys. I remember he had a big uh, <laughs> boy. Carry a, up on our doorstep. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> that always. yeah. Um, piece of trivia he was the voice of the guy that gets eaten in uh, Alien Encounter. The <laughs> <laughs> voice, the guy that sure gets eaten. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> your home entertainment center. <laughs> Wasn't that Randy Bennett? Uh, uh, oh, with the uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chamber Center, I think, was uh, Randy Cook, the, the artist. The uh, projection, the three color projection. Here's our movie review. Oh. <laughs> Here's El Toaster. <laughs> <laughs> El Tostero. <laughs> that scene got cut. <laughs> Here's your dragonfly. Cute. Pretty sure that's one of Kevin's. I think most of these are Kevin's. Birds, just right from the meadow. meadow. Random birds. Oh, and then and then the, the frogs. Oh yeah, yeah. To do the uh, yeah, Busby, Busby Berkeley thing. Or did the uh, Busby Berkeley choreography with us? But that's a missing sequence, right? And flies. <laughs> did, did we did we have I don't remember the flies. Uh, just <laughs> in, the, in the meadow. Just in the meadow. <laughs> oh that's right. Yeah. That's right. They're doing some of the little fuzzy sounds. These these mm -hmm. are the mice that come up the blankie and start chewing on their yeah. master's picture. They try, oh, no, no, they try to pull him down their their little mouse yeah. hole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 There's a gopher. He said, are you looking at me, gopher? <laughs> yes, he got cut out of the movie, but he was the taxi driver uh, gopher. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't happen by then? Okay. The taxi driver? I think it's so. Oh, you're looking at me. Yes. Because he was looking in the reflection, right? Yeah, he's yeah, seeing himself. himself. And that part was actually boarded out, yeah. yeah. Going back now, B. Don't remember B, but there's a B. This is part of the Fuzzy Meadow music. The skunk, and they are, and the color versions of those are on the long cell oh, on the yeah, wall too. They so there they are. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The rough. Same yeah. pose. Yeah. Owl. Yeah. So I don't remember him, but it's just uh, flies to be uh, dramatic in the forest. Raccoon. I mean, there's a whole other movie in this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice design there. I don't know, Jerry. Too many characters. <laughs> That's right. Yes, that was one of the monsters. There's Elmo. Looks like Chris yeah, Quadruped. So didn't Quadruped <coughs> belong to Elmo? <laughs> yeah, Quadruped was Elmo's dog. Yeah. Yeah. There's the Beaver. I don't remember him. Yeah, they do the tail tail oh, slaps as part of the music in the. In the meadow, so, you guys see any of this? Yeah, yeah, but I'm in front of him. So. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, I think you got this blanket. Do we have him? Yeah, yeah. Do with the commercial with it. And there's an original. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just uh, one of the B movie characters. Yeah. Another, another original. I don't know how they how I ended up with these, but yeah, that's what that's fun. original studio property. I know. Oh, yeah. 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 Call uh, yeah. call Cleve Reinhardt. Call Will Height. 
this is a layout. I don't know if any any of you guys, oh, Jim, oh, nice. or, or this is yours, oh, Brian. I know where that. Uh, okay. It's there. probably one of my rocks or something. That was the uh, the art shop. Shop shop. This is one of Joe's. I had a, I had T-shirts made of this for the crew. <laughs> yeah. It was one of Joe uh, Ramp's boards. I I have the. That sequence of that character that was cut out after the break we take later on, uh, I can show people boards for the uh, the mole that got cut out of the movie. So I ha I have that that sequence. Peter Lorre. Yes, Peter You poor baby, so your bulb is burned out. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 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 Don't into my chair. Yeah. And then this is uh, this is the Victrola that starts the uh, the, the B movie. Song. And you know, they're cool looking characters. You only get a quick glimpse of them in the movie. Yeah. I love this one. This is the Mishmash. Is that Mindy? That was Judy Toll. Judy. As well. I'm a Mishmash, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was Judy. Oh, this was a special model sheet of yawns. I, yes. think I, did, <laughs> I think I did that for Rebecca just to that will, yeah, torment yeah. her. The, yeah. the mall sequence had a, was uh, had yawns, so yeah. it was actually in the boards. So. Oh, is that is that what? It, yeah, it actually that's where the mole got everybody. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, Steve. Okay, we now go back to uh, this picture by Janine. Dawson, Jeannie Dawson, who was on another crew, did a drawing of our crew. And so we have Rebecca and me and Brian, and Joe, Steve, Randy, Chuck, Steve. And there you are, Chris and uh, Chris and Kevin and Anne and Tanya. And uh, that was the group that went overseas to Taiwan. So the, here we are with James Wong who ran uh, Cuckoo's Nest Studios in Taiwan. And uh, what a lifesaver he was. He wanted to have the influence by Disney trained artists to help his people improve. And he gave us a huge price break. So that two and a quarter million for the 90 minutes, uh, he made that possible by cutting the price way down. And the agreement was we would really train and teach his people during the process of making the movie. And so he was great. And we moved in there. Rebecca got very comfortable. See, Joe and I uh, we weren't sure what it said on the side of the can when we got there, but we <laughs> drank it anyway. And uh, Rebecca with uh, several of the translators. translators. Yeah. And then with the whole class, I think this was this was your class, right? With that was the, my uh, crew. That was that your was crew, crew for the uh, the assistants yeah. for that part. Because so Rebecca was being a directing animator, but also teaching all the assistants how to do cleanup and in between and stuff like that. So you had a lot. So there's Rebecca and her team. And uh, they asked us to give them all American names. So we went through and would find different reasons to name them. Yeah. Sometimes people they reminded us of we, you know, my, my parents are on there. Uh, there's even <laughs> there's people uh, where some of those Rick, Lucy, Fred and Ethel. <laughs> and uh, but they just were yeah. delighted. They, they wanted to have names assigned uh, and they would wait for us to declare who they would be. So, do you remember, was Pooh one of the translators? Um, I can't remember, but I think I named her after my, our cat, Pooh. Yeah, we had, Stefan and Pooh were our two cats. We were running out of names, so I started just, my Dolly, that's my mom's name, and there's my grandfather's name, Frank, and, uh, Yeah, and Richard is your dad, and yeah. Dolly is your mom, and... Beethoven was because he was deaf. He was deaf, oh, yeah. Oh, true. Beethoven was deaf, oh, yeah, so yeah. named him Beethoven. I, I worked with a camera operator who called himself Fonzie. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve, here's a bunch of you uh, on one of the rare occasions where you got to leave the studio and go to the temples and things and look around. So I'm so glad that this group picture got taken. Um, James again, uh, treating us to the best treatment. Wonderful restaurants. Uh, you know, I'm a third generation vegetarian and just love that there were a lot of options for vegetarians over there. There's uh, Sanvi, who was a wonderful translator. Uh, and production, production, and production manager. manager and yeah. yeah. What else did you 
was what True. Cuckoo's Nest doing at the time? They, they a lot of kind of barbaric uh, stuff. They did a lot of HP. Yeah. 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 They were doing the snorks. But you can see the, you know, it was a similar situation that we had in the U.S. where it was all just kind of crowded in the building. And uh, there was Wu who was just so delightful. I, I, I felt like Wu was sort of their, their Joe. I felt like yeah. when I would look at them, I just felt the same sort of spirit from them. And they were both brilliant at their drawings. It was just the personality would just come right through the simplest sketch uh for both of them so that was just delightful and i and james uh allowed us to do something really unusual which was kind of set a, a new hierarchy inside the studio structure he said he wanted to really do disney quality training so i asked him i said is, is it okay if i give people titles appropriate to our film and not care whether they've been here three weeks or ten years and he said yes yes that's allowed so I was able to really just look at people's skill levels for what we needed and assign them roles. So that was a, a real gift to help help us get to the finish line more efficiently and creatively. Uh, Brian, I think this is us having a conversation back before I wore black uh, V t-shirts all the time. <laughs> and uh, I think if the camera were to pan over just a little bit, there was a water buffalo in that field. Probably, probably. All the time. This was the rice field. And at the time, Cuckoo's Nest was right next to just like rice fields. Um, you know, like nothing else there. Yeah, and I remember a water buffalo was there yeah. most of the time. It was about 100 degrees, 100% yeah. humidity. Wow. Right, right. And then we, we because of... Uh, the you know the work visas and stuff I, I i don't think they ever really set us up appropriately so we actually had to leave the country every month and then come back and so this was on one of our trips away so and work there legally. yeah so we came in on basically tourist visas and every and you got 90 days or something else like that so, so we, we had to leave. yeah then we went to so hong kong, hong kong and, and japan Tokyo. In Tokyo, and I remember the first time we all had to leave and come back the same day, and that made them really suspicious. <laughs> and and uh, got, a got a question? Yeah, about Taiwan. Yes. Um, from Chase Pritchard. Oh, hi, Chase. Yes, Chase wants to know um, since you're talking about Taiwan, what are the memories from other crew and cast, or not crew, for uh, Taiwan? Your memories there. Anybody other had uh, other than Snake Alley? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mosquitoes were really scary, Cockroaches. and uh, uh, you know they were they were probably about as big as your pinky finger, and uh, they would sort of um, they'd like to hide in the corners of your room, so you you could walk in and you'd see this sort of like little group of them over there, kind of hovering, just waiting for you to come in, and then uh, uh, the 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 Taiwanese had these little pads. That you'd plug in, you know, like those, you know, those stinkums people put in their house that, that like air fresheners. Well, these are these little things you put these pads on, and you couldn't smell anything, but within about five minutes, every mosquito in the room would be dead. <laughs> and so you kind of, you kind of had to, you kind of had to weigh whether is is this a good thing or not. But at least you didn't get bit. Wow. It would swell. Oh, like a welt. Yeah, yeah, yeah like they would make a big welt. So you knew in the morning when you'd come to work and you'd say good morning and somebody put a big welt all over there. And it was awful. It would last for days and very painful. And I yeah. remember um, the Cleve Reinhardt set us up in apartments in the city of Taipei. If you, your plan was to be as far as possible from the studio, he succeeded. <laughs> that was a long drive. Well, yeah, a taxi drive to the studio, out to lunch, back to the studio, and back home. And I don't know if this happened for those of you that were in other taxis, but we we had real problems pronouncing words properly there. So we'd get into the taxi every single time, and we would say what we thought was the name of the town we were going to, Xintian. And they would go, huh? We go, Xintian. Huh? And so we'd for about 50 times we go Shin Tian, Shin Tian, Shin Tian, Shin Tian, Shin Tian. And finally we would hit the intonation and they'd go, oh, Shin Tian. And we would think, didn't we say that? But no, it's like you could say Ni Hao Ma or Ni Hao Ma. And that, the difference was 
how are you or how's your horse, you know? So, so <laughs> we just sounded stupid, but we would sit there and repeat and repeat. And then finally the taxi would take us, take us where we were going. And we learned turn around and stop and as like taxi. Stop. Yeah, <laughs> Dowla. <laughs> I always have the uh, address of the apartment on a piece of paper. Yeah. Good idea. Just show it. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember one, one day when I, when I came in in the morning, uh, there's one one of the animators there, the Taiwanese animators, could speak a little Japanese, and I could speak a little Japanese, and we could s speak a little bit together. And he was trying to explain this thing, very excited in the morning, and he couldn't figure, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? So finally, he 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 gave up and he drew a picture. And he drew a picture of a rocket ship and then a big explosion. <gasps> oh, it was the space That's shuttle that morning. Challenge. Right. Wow. And I remember oh. we we were so confused because we didn't know what had happened. And we go by stores that had like 20 television screens and they were all playing the explosion of the Challenger. And we, and at the time that wasn't happening here, but there when they would show something like that on the news, it would play dramatic score music, like you were watching a movie. And we were just wondering what had happened. So I remember that was a very, very, very confusing time. Yeah, my first day there, TV. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You don't forget that on the first day. Yeah. I remember. You know, I remember. It's the first day. Just wandering around. You know, you get to the hotel and you know, wander around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and we're, and it was just like it was raining, and it was just like out of Blade Runner. It was like I landed in Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, like you say, the TVs and the, and the things exploding, and you're like, well, what is that? And, and you know, it's all Chinese, so you couldn't understand any of it. But, right. And I also just, uh, even though I, I uh, it was a really interesting thing, even though I felt like it was on Miss, Mr. Toad's wild ride every time you'd ride in a taxi where, uh, you know, we'd have people come over from Hong Kong to visit, from Japan to visit, and they would all be shocked when they'd ride in the taxis with us because they were so scared. They'd be gripping the seat and we'd be like driving against traffic and daring a bus and then swerving in at the last second. And... <laughs> But I, during six months there, I only encountered one rude taxi driver. Like all of them were such nice drivers and would try to help you the best they could. So it was this weird thing where it was kind of felt dangerous, but super friendly. And <laughs> one of our taxi drivers. Oh, yeah. And then the, the chicken feet down there. Yeah. <laughs> one time, I don't know if you were with us, uh, Brian, but. Um, we were in a taxi and we came to a red light and we're waiting and then all the cars on the right and left of us are going and we're just sitting there and we looked over and i poked him and yeah, he I'm... was asleep the taxi driver <laughs> he had just fallen asleep and was, his head was down yeah i was sitting in the front so, seat well, next will you wake him up i'm not going to wake him up You're, all the cars are just going past and he's snoring <laughs> but as soon as he woke up he hit the throttle he realized i'm asleep boom and just went but I, I, I always took, we called it the suicide seat because there were no seat belts. And it was, and we saw. They weren't allowed to put on seat belts. They didn't let you do it. We, start but, but, on, they'd say, no, that's bad luck. We saw, for an accident. Oh, we wow. saw, we witnessed at least one accident as it happened every week, uh, minimum. And so I, whenever we were going together in the taxi, I would always take the front seat because I went I'm, I'm if we're going through a windshield I'll be the first one I'm not going to let you guys do it and I was so glad finally when uh, you know we were finally done and and I loved James and loved his people but there were certain things that were uh, a little risky and I every time I put one of you on a plane and saw it leave I was so relieved that we had finished our task and you were whole and you were going home. <laughs> so, you should tell when the today, day we're going home. Today we were going home, a typhoon hit. And so you walked outside and the rain was basically going, going sideways. horizontally. But the cab showed up. And so we got in the cab. Just heading to the airport going, going the airport, are we going to even get, be able to know, go home? Because the cabs were driving. They didn't care, typhoon or not. And we yeah. got up to the, the airport was sort of inland and lit, and I guess a little bit higher. And all of a sudden it cleared, and I don't know if we were in the eye of the typhoon or whatever it was, but we were able to get there, get on the plane, and get out before everything created the grain. Well, we also got one of the crazy drivers, you right. know, like the beetle nut drivers. 
and and uh. we were going you know like this over the roads and the rain's going sideways and the car's going and chuck's going i don't want to die here i don't want to die here <laughs> so then yeah. then when we got to the airport it was just like everything cleared away right. our plane took off and we oh, went home yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then the planes going mm. and it was, you know um, despite all of that stuff uh it it's funny how people feel the, the film feels so homey and comfortable and you know i just it, it was so nice that everyone involved from our team from the cuckoo's nest team really embraced the story we were telling and the characters and and it's kind of amazing when you look back because we would have because part of the reality was we'd have things like first time people would come to visit they would be taken to snake alley where there's like live cobra and mongoose fights happening on the sidewalk and just uh you know all this kind of heightened uh, craziness that people enjoyed um but then we would get back in the studio and yeah new year's where it was this fireworks being boxes of fireworks being set where it was like the like the, the Mary Poppins scene where it, people are playing golf with fire rockets and stuff that really was like that. In an apartment complex, there were like four apartments and then a street underneath there and on New Year's, the kids in the apartments and the higher ones, they would have these buckets of bottle rockets and all that kind of stuff. Like they, in boxes. And they and would and aim them at the guy, the kids on the other cross. side of the thing and they would so start yeah. shooting back and forth on them. It was like yes. this, this yeah. rocket. Going sideways yeah, all yeah. the time, and it wasn't just for an evening. This went on for a week. Yeah. So yeah, every, we, every 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 morning, uh, when someone left for work, they would shoot off a string of firecrackers for like a whole week for the Chinese New Year's week. And so every morning, from like five in the morning, it's like every five minutes, there'll be a firecrackers going off. Well, was, I had I had <laughs> I had seen a number of people with one damaged eye before that happened where I saw a lot of people where they were blinded in one eye. And yeah. So I, I was looking around going, what's going to hit me in the eye? And it, you know, we're, we started talking about it as a group, like I've never been somewhere where it's that prevalent. We should be careful when that happened. And then I saw like boxes lit on fire and children running through exploding fireworks and went, Oh, that's probably it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I just won't do that. So. <laughs> Mild noise they had guys that would make sugared puff wheat and they would come in like it was like a Saturday or early in the morning when there was nobody there and he could push this cart in the center of, of an intersection and make a sound and then he would start loading like a cannon a basically. cannon full of wheat and this and that and everything else and he would seal it up and heat it all up so it got really hot inside and then he would open it and it and then there's this boom, boom and it would explode and it's into kind this of like container here you know you'd hear the ice cream man and you have the right. little tinkly music and stuff no there it's the cannon sound <laughs> yeah. and all the little kids would come running out of the buildings you know. to go get their puff they would sweet you know we would flatten it out like, and cut it in squares they'd make it like wow. uh like rice crispy bars sort of mm -hmm. and all the kids would come running out when they'd hear the cannon go in a place at like the, that at the studio sure, with thing. the uh the uh elephant walk where there was a certain time every afternoon where you'd hear and and Rebecca would be going over scenes with the assistants and they'd get all squirmy and, and they'd be talking to each other and she's like what's going on they go can we come back in five minutes and, and uh, they'd leave and then and then we're like well, what's going on what's with this elephant walk thing and every day this was happening everybody would just charge out the door so she went with them one time Rebecca did and and what Oh, it was, you would stand there, and normally you make lines, and the but next was, one you go, it, the it next a, one. It was, it was like a, a, a bakery, sort of a bakery truck. truck. Right? Yeah, like yeah. But you couldn't just wait and say, okay, now you're next, and you get right. behind me. Oh, it would just people piling on top of each other. <laughs> so if you really want something, you'd have to kind of do this sort of thing and, you know, elbow your way. So, but I was curious and I got something and, you know, ate it. But I, I wanted to know why people just disappeared. <laughs> you know? She's actually all beat up. But I had a bagel. <laughs> Um, also, another interesting thing was the, the, the roaches, the cockroaches, were, were seasonal. So in springtime, they got very colorful and they could fly. 
Oh, yeah. So if you think a cockroach this big is scary walking on the ground, imagine it coming and flying towards you. And we didn't know that until right we were watching TV. And then I said, there's one on the goes TV. Skittering across the floor and then takes off. So yeah, and it flew and it was flying around. And I'm screaming and hiding in the bathroom and Cherry. Do you remember you remember Kato, Kato the cockroach? Yeah. I'm from the Pink Panther movies, there was Kato who would attack. But we determined that there was Kato the cockroach in our apartment. So it was my task to go in first. Rebecca would wait outside and I'd yeah. let him attack me and then I would deal with him and then she could come in. So. You go clear. <laughs> Is this the one that she set fire to on the, on the oh, yeah. range and then it, came, oh, it was still I, alive? I, I did that. Oh, you did that. You did. I think you were giving me a haircut that day. Oh, yeah. I did. It flew on your range and, and I. Turned a burner on. Like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> cook them, you know, because we couldn't, you know, we couldn't catch them. So we we'll go cook them. He caught fire. And he's flying around on fire. Pull <laughs> <laughs> out the curtains. <laughs> was this uh, was this your your oh, apartment building? There we yeah, go. This is this is where our apartment was. Was right in this area. Like if you go back, when that's our apartment building. Up on like the second or third floor, yeah, I think we were. We were right on this corner. And so, and then all these, the, the bottom layer is all shops, which was quiet yeah. right here, but starting like four or five in the afternoon or something, when people would get off work, everything opened up and everything was, the streets would be jammed and there would be people all over the place. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, an earthquake uh, that was, I think it was the worst one they'd had in 35 years that happened when we were there. And I just, I remember it distinctly because up in those buildings, they swayed a lot. And when it hit, Rebecca and I just, we thought the building was going to go down. I mean, that the floor was tilting back and forth and you don't go for the stairs, you're seven floors up. You don't go for the elevator. So we just hugged and said, I love you and waited. And we just thought that would be maybe the last hug. And then we survived, but later we looked back and went, you know, that probably says a good thing about our relationship that that's what we did. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't scream, we didn't hit each other. We didn't leap out the window, we just hugged and and waited yeah, and it was scary. okay Very scary. But, yeah. uh so yeah you you guys were all, all i i don't know where everyone was during that time but uh we had a seven floors up uh wow. wild ride this apartment was nice because just across the street see where the little motorbike is yeah. if you go right right across the street there was a grocery store like a supermarket uh, like a supermarket <laughs> which was one of the few supermarkets in the area and so it was very convenient for Do you us. remember we used to ask people to bring certain foods when they come right. to visit? Yeah. I remember when we had to leave and we went to um, Hong Kong and we found a Mexican restaurant in Hong Kong. And we just like every, we like ate there and covered everything. And then Rebecca was gathering enchiladas to take back to, to Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, was, you know, salsa, well, it was a taste that we didn't realize we missed so much and looked at months and months go by. <laughs> so yes. I specifically remember I ordered a big bowl of guacamole, right? Mm -hmm. It's like one of those big ones that you're supposed to share. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and everybody was like, oh, and they're getting ready. I go, no, that's my guacamole. Nobody's coming near my guacamole. <laughs> I recall, who was it? Was it you? Somebody ate two entire entrees when we finally got to the Mexican restaurant. But that was you. <laughs> and then did, where, did you throw up also? Yeah, I yeah did. okay. <laughs> Well, I'm going to jump here for a moment to this man. Oh, man. Yay! And uh, it's just astounding the work that David did for us on this film. I, I got a lot of shots of you conducting because it's just uh, inspiring to see you after your after the moment of creating it, then to guide the orchestra, I always just think is amazing. And uh, uh, before I ask you to say a few words, I'll just read this to you that I, I put on my website. David Newman's original score for The Brave Little Toaster is an inseparable part of the film's soul. It expresses the deep emotional longing <laughs> that keeps the dysfunctional ensemble going despite impossible odds. David's music never aims to trivialize or caricature the simply animated characters, instead embracing their joys and fears as genuine. Intimate and epic in turns, David's beloved score remains one of his best. And uh, gosh, the, the liner notes, uh, it was a David 
Schweiger, who wrote the liner notes, uh, he has some quotes from you in there about uh, working on that huge, long uh, piece that was, uh, what, eight minutes that you had to write? Oh, the end of the movie. End yeah. of the movie? Yeah. Yeah, I had to figure out how many minutes of music I could write in a day, which was about two. And then this was seven, so I think it was a 50-hour thing. But it's nothing compared to what you guys were doing. Well, it, I think in here, uh, well, Daniel Schweiger is his name. Daniel. Daniel yeah, Schweiger. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, some here it, it has you talking about. Um, I worked. I worked on the plane, and then I worked, and I worked all. I, I, you guys were partying on you the said plane. You, you had to stay up fifty <laughs> hours to write and orchestrate uh, the music, and you weren't finished by the end of the twelve-hour flight. You were still still writing well, on the plane. I wasn't finished till the next yeah till the yeah. next day, when it, and then they had to copy it would, and stuff. You would say, "Gary, what do you think of this?" And then you'd give them the <laughs> ear. You you had yeah. headphones. Yeah. I mean, you had a keyboard. I, I, I did. And I you must would, have. Yeah. You I think I was orchestrating on the on the on the plane. Yeah. I learned I learned a lot. I, I it was really early on for me, so I, I learned what I could do in a day by myself. You know, with, without any help. Um, but. Um, God, what a scene! That is the wackiest scene. You know the how yep. dark it just gets so dark. Yeah. You know before before the the toaster sacrifices herself. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, uh, but it was it was uh, yeah it was yeah. it was definitely a learning experience. But God, looking at what you guys did, the animation that you mm -hmm. showed before, yeah, yeah. it's just that's early on, right? It's it's yeah. all there. Yeah. I mean, the expression, it, it is, it's so lovely. That's why it, it, music is so good with animation because mm -hmm. you can do, you can do a lot more stuff because of all the intricacies that you sort of highlight when you animate. I, I mean, I don't, I assume that's what you're, what you're doing. Yeah, so it, it, it heightens and caricature certain aspects. So something hopefully feels like what would happen in your life rather than documenting what it looks like yeah. at that moment in your life and since you're heightening caricatured moments of emotion music i think fits with it beautifully you just, and theatrically you, you just and, I, and i remember you saying like um you know you wanted a theme for everyone everyone was all now there's no themes but that was the time when there were themes but we had a theme for everything and we used it all a lot yeah i mean yeah. there was a theme for every character and i know that you wanted that so um, generally, that is something that people ask for, but then they don't want it. You just have sort of an uber yeah. theme. But this was a thing of mixing it all, of them all being together, you know. Well, you know was, and then that final scene yeah. where it just is doom. They yeah. are doomed, yeah. right? And yeah. even at the end, they're, what he said in the review, there's something, they're grown up, like there's something not sad about it, but they're not these naive thing you know and, yeah. and look what the movie spawned seriously seriously right. yeah. what it spawned i mean this was like this was like this was this was the beginning of something what you guys what you guys did with this right. it's it's an it's an incredible piece of work you know so, well i yeah. appreciate those thoughts and it's just uh, what you did for the movie was so amazing and it's like it framed and embraced all of that and and you know the the effort deanna that at the beginning i was taking with you all in the the acting of the characters you know the um somebody got in touch with me not that long ago and said the they went back and read the book and they said typically when i go back and read a book i find out deeper things about the characters and they said that the opposite was true i like knew much less when i read the book and much more in the film and I said, well, that was one of the first things that I wanted to take on when we were working together. You know, Tom had said, Tom Wilhite, the producer had said, people are telling me this would be a nice short. Like, why am I trying to make a feature? And so he said, you know, it needs lots of development, lots of work to turn into a feature, but I think you're the person to do it. So I hunkered down with Joe and Brian and Alex and Daryl, and we started digging into who the individual characters were instead of the ensemble like here the group goes it's like what is each character so yeah. as you guys as so we tried to define 
what the psychology of each character would be and the tone. And then when you guys individually brought each one to life, and then when David took the music and went, now I'm highlighting their individuality too. So I can embrace the ensemble, but I can embrace their individual they all, they selves. They have music in their voices too, particularly yeah. I think yeah. that kind of sing song, you know, wow, everything's good. Yeah, yeah. And then they take this journey and it, and it, yeah. it just, it changes. It yeah, has a lot of nuance in it, which is they're just... So, yeah, they, they start with such a naive, optimistic attitude. Well, you the... worked, you strived, you told us, yeah. don't do cut, don't do cut to any voice. Yeah, yeah. You just wanted us to be real and genuine and express emotions and not go, I, 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 I. Yeah, you and, know, so well, I, the main characters. Absolutely, yeah. and, I, and, and one of the reasons that when you guys did that and brought the reality to it, I. It, to me, it was like a, a rescue was because I had, had gone through a brief experience where I took some pages I'd written, brought in some people to read before I found you. And it was so depressing because they were doing all of that. Uh, you know, here, here it was a crazy situation. And all of us that were telling the story were saying, well, what would it be like to really be these characters and really want to be useful and really miss someone and really try your hardest and really get into trouble? And and now maybe be crushed and you know like what would that feel like and they would come in and goof on it, the whole right. thing so it's like oh it's all a joke we're winging right. to the audience Ugh, you know and that's just, that's and, me. And, <laughs> just and i remember looking at the page and going i know in my mind when i wrote this page it sounded better in my head than it's sounding right now and joe bless his heart was just saying well I, you know i've been working at the groundlings improv theater taking classes there to try to just up my game and they have some really cool people you want to go listen to them and I was like yes please let's go listen and then when I went and saw you guys on stage you were doing the opposite of what these other people did uh, where they were saying how can I make this as crazy as possible when I act you were being handed by the audience crazy situations and you were trying to make them relatable and right. believable so somebody go you're a you're a radish, and then who is he? A stock of celery. It's like, right. well, what are they doing? They, they meet at a bus stop, and then what happens? Right. They fall in love. It's like, and it's your job to go. How do I make that believable? Right. So play it for real. Yeah. yeah. So boy, as soon as you guys yeah. took the stage, it was it was a beautiful thing. One of the so. things I always appreciated about the voice talent and and David's music is that it would have been so easy to just uh, treat it like a kiddie movie or you know, some some cheap little two million dollar film. Uh, you know, you gave us a real score. You, you guys gave us real voice performances. You know, and and for us, I mean, animation people are kind of crazy, and it's really easy for us to just imagine a real world with toasters walking around. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so when when other people can come into that world with that same commitment, it just makes it so good. And I think that's what made this movie really blossom was was how, that. How did they? It's a, a huge orchestra with a premier mixer with a the first a, a digital Sony twenty four track, and it's all in a truck outside. And there's a huge <laughs> organ, and it. How did all that? I mean, it, it's such kismet that that happened. That is so because. For that budget, I mean, I don't yeah. know how you did that, and I guess we knew. I, think I know Tom, Tom and Tom Wilhite and Willa Carroll, but we're we're trying their best to barter with people, to talk about potentials, to to get a few pennies here and there to go towards it. I remember the they were handing me things to put in the movie, like, well, uh, you know, TDK Core Company is yeah. going to give us a few dollars if you put their logo in a background. I'm like, I'll draw it myself. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I was but they... completely first class as far as the um, the uh, the uh, what what we had to work with 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 music. I mean, and it, it John, couldn't John have been. It, was there, right? Yeah, I mean, who does all John Williams stuff still? You know, yeah. and 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 it's a it's a it was Seiji Ozawa's orchestra, and they have all these beautiful halls in Tokyo. It was yeah. a, though we were like an hour out of Tokyo, and we had five days i think or four days to do 35 minutes of music 40 minutes of of, of music i mean it, it was just weird how that got set up that that got done i didn't know it was too much that's incredible yeah, two and a quarter the, million yeah. For the whole, the whole wow um the uh, let me 
we see here. I got two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it certainly wasn't oh, salary-wise, but, but in, in and I would just of... mention too that uh, it was so nice when we went to to mix, and I remember the guys at the mixing board turned around to me and said, "Well, you know, this is uh, animated. What do you want us to do?" And I said, "Well, I'd like you to forget that it's animated." and just do the best movie mix you've ever done. Yeah, well, and they were like, oh. They're also the premier covers yeah. too. I mean, uh, yeah. And, and then there was all I, that as stupid- As soon as I gave her permission to just like do stuff. your best, mm -hmm. instead of like do yeah. something different because it's a cartoon, it's like, no, forget it is. Just do it's your best mix. It's a beautiful dub. Yeah. And uh, so they did. Yeah. Yeah. All, that, all that was completely, all that post-production music was all first class. Even now it would be, it would be first class. However the hell they figured that out, I have no idea. Now, I, I'm gonna dream aloud for a moment. I would love to see David Newman with a live orchestra yeah. conducting the score to the Brave Little Toaster while the movie shows. Oh, yeah. And I would love to have it be sing along for the music parts. And so not only would Deanna and, and our other people get up and, and be singing, but people in the audience could choose ahead of time. We'd ask, like, who's going to sing Blanky's part? Who's going to sing Kirby? Who's gonna, and then you could have that. And uh, so we just need to start a. We need to write letters to Steve Waterman, who owns the property. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, let's take a little break. And we're yes. going to take a picture. Okay. Before everybody scatters, but we're going to take a break. And we'll take a break. And when we come back from break, uh, we'll open it up to just questions from anyone. But I'll probably start with uh, a brief storyboard section for a section I cut out with the, the mole that makes everybody yawn, which is the reason I cut it out. <laughs> About the master's pogo stick. No, that's no good. Hey, how about we're in the refrigerator on a skateboard and Kirby can pull? No, no, no. Hey! Shut up, shut up! Shut up! Let somebody else try for a change. Arise, Hassan. Arise, oh magic carpet.
It's like a journey on a road that's within. Your head says you should stay, but your heart says to begin. So you go. But you don't want to go. Any life worth living isn't life just filled with ease. You just stay forgiving through the forest and the trees. And, and you'll go. Just where you want to go. Time fly by in the city of light. Time stands still in the country. There's no time for a fuss and a fight as we travel the land. And I'd be satisfied just to be not denied to reside with some pride. What a ride to the city, the city of light. Light shines like a diamond in the city at night. To know, we got a way to go. Never speak to master, we don't want to make him wait. You just keep a knock and he will open up the gate to that city of light. Master is a man with a plan I can understand. Just to be not denied To reside with some pride What a ride to the city, the city of light
Oh, oh yeah. No, oh, it's on me now. It shouldn't be though. Where? That sound is someone moving round. Sit down for a spell. You don't look so well. Wait a minute, I feel great. You just leave yourself to bed. You might as well just hang around. Day to day, we've got to operate. Just try to relax. It's the house of wax. Oh, I And make it disappear. This is strange. It ain't no more That you got to it. There goes the sun. Here comes the night. Somebody turn on the light. Somebody tell me that fate has been kind.
Pixel screen displays for you. Computer graphics locked into your memory. memory, memory, memory. With fiber optics, cast in plastic, for nights with sights and sounds fantastic. Just reach out and talk to your dear old Uncle Emery. Everything you wanted and more. Hey, I can bake your biscuits too. Pop some dough boy out for you. I'm micro solid state, and that's no static. Or, or, or. Everything you want is that or. Or, or, or. Where the fighting chips before, you just have yourself a ball. It's all hyperactive. From LEDs to CRTs, woofers, tweeters, antenna trees, and ultra nylon life of ease. Everything you think of on the edge and more. One more dusty road would be just a road too long. I just can't, I just can't, I just can't seem to get started. Don't have the heart to live in the fast lane. All that is past and gone. And there ain't nothing you can do about it.
Hey, is the is the building still there, Jerry? Do you know? I'm not sure. No, no. The place is still there. I think we should all drive down there, all right? Right after. I think it's still there. I think they asked us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna do two things uh, right away. Uh, first thing up, I would like to show the behind the scenes footage that Mr. Steve Siegel filmed while we were in Taiwan. And uh, so I think Isaiah has it ready to go. Uh, I think it's a feed from YouTube. Let's do that. Sparking. What? 
doing, huh? Making a movie. Your movie. <laughs> Hey, that's pretty good. I've never seen her do that before. Folks, this is the first. I want to go back. I want to go back to Hollywood. I'm so happy. Good luck. I'm going to ask you 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 and they have to be done by tomorrow. I'll show you a good shot. There. Isn't that beautiful? That's pretty? Take five. Take five. Take five. I do need coffee. He's rising. Yeah, he finishes rising. So we're just full blast storm here. That'll be a neat sound cut. A long, long pan to the compactor down here in this corner gets crunch. I mean, Jerry's talking, he doesn't even want to do this. He doesn't even oh. think this is dramatic enough. He likes it real. What he wants to do is like a long, long pan. And then way down here would be uh, the compactor. Like a helicopter shot. Yeah. Yeah, everything's like a helicopter shot. Yeah. So this is fine for like the end, mm -hmm. but the very beginning we have a whole lot. And real quick, guys, out. Uh, Yes, they're just like butterflies. Yeah, you're going to have to make that up. Okay? Make up a pattern for them.
hearing about today, a national holiday, in honor of those five amazing appliances we've all been hearing about. So lock up the office, take down the top, and open that rumble seat. That's when the Coney Island is a party for us. From the starlight roof, tidy on top the wrist, we wish... Looks like he turns to him. Yeah, very right, kind of good. shooting toaster.
Hello, Monica. This is the last scene. This is okay. Okay. This is NG for jiggles again. And then this is uh, 530. Flashing. Also, Jerry wants to check the timing, so I should go to Jerry. Watch the move on it. Okay. Ooh. Wow. So, is that good? James Wong is president of Cuckoo's Nest. And Sam Chairman, Chairman. Hmm? Chairman. Chairman. Yeah. Chairman Mall. Because of him, we can make this film. Steve, one of the one of the challenges, many challenges you were doing was the pullback from the window when Blanky's looking outside and hopes it's the master coming back, and then there's that long pullback. Uh, you know, nowadays that would be a simple thing, but back then, you know, in 80, 86, 85, 86, that was a tough one. And you took on the challenge of doing match dissolves all the way back through through all those different backgrounds. What were there, five backgrounds? Something like that. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. But he gave that emotional thing of the close-up of the character all the way back to the distant shot where he's left alone. And that, I remember you wanted to make that better. I, I was ready to kind of accept sort of jump cuts or, or some kind of obvious dissolve. And you said, if we do this right, we can match dissolve it and make it look better. So I appreciated that. Well, I, I, what I remember is um, uh, it was just a series of unmatched dissolves and i yes. said wouldn't it be better as one long pullback and you yeah. said that's what i always wanted yeah but they said that you couldn't that was impossible and i said well let me give it a try yep. and chuck gave me a really hard time though because it took, <laughs> took about four months yes. i mean i was doing a lot of other stuff at the same time but every i had a, a, a spare hour or something i would yes. match do a match dissolve and it was mm. like um, rotoscoping yeah. i was just projecting a light and lining it up by yeah. eye so, I, I guess we saw it the same way, at least. But I did it once, and then you said, "Oh no, that's not." You wanted oh. like to to have a little a little motion, a little rolling motion to right, it, right. like easing, and and I kind of just pulled straight back, um, so I had to do it over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, and I, I think yeah, I heard Kevin saying that you know i wasn't satisfied with the toaster throwing itself in the gears that i wanted a bigger you know i had personally storyboarded that section where it did the big leap to uh you know to grind in the gears and yeah i had pictured like a much longer transition so uh yeah i knew it was going to be arduous for people but uh, you know i felt like we needed that and i i think uh it all paid off yeah. i mean look at the movie and uh brian i think we were seeing some of ken o'connor's yeah. color stylings along the way there we uh, you know God, brian was, yeah that was a really fortunate oh, yeah. uh, turn of events and uh, another one of the sort of magical things that happened on the movie is that i was trying to get uh somebody to do to to paint uh you know color versions to of uh the uh story so that when we went to taiwan we would have all those little color thumbnails and i couldn't find anyone in town to do it and so uh then uh, I just had this wacky idea of asking Ken O'Connor, you know, who's like this brilliant Disney, you know, genius legend, legend um, 
and was my teacher and I asked him, well, would you be willing to, to, you know, pitch in and do some color sketches for us? And he said, oh, I would be delighted. And he was, he was all excited about it. And uh, he, he color sketched the whole film. Yeah, we went out and met him in his, uh, his big workshop at home, his yeah. garage studio. And you would make reduced versions of uh, some of your layouts. And they were literally color thumbnails because it yeah. was about that big. Was yes. And you could pin them up and follow the emotional flow of the entire movie, and it gave you anchors for the background painting all the way through. Wow. And the other really wonderful thing about him, uh, and a real tribute to just how professional this man was, is I was, you know, this young kid student you know, thrown into the frying pan of being an art director for the first time. And here was this legend and he was he's saying, well, what would you like here for this scene or that scene? And he was, he was letting me lead, you know, which for me was just like overwhelming. Um, and uh, then what he would also do was as he got these layouts, if, if layouts were egregiously like, bad <laughs> he would relay them out and he would go um i was thinking maybe we should do this something a little more like and i was like oh he fixed that great yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> so that was a that was a really uh a, a wonderful contribution to the movie and brian i always you know i've told you this before but i i thought it was such a bold illustration of a principle your whole involvement with the film is that it doesn't cost more to have good taste. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, they would sit there and paint colors on a cell, and it would cost a certain amount for that cell to get painted. They could either paint crappy colors or right. really good colors, which yeah. you chose before they painted them. And the film just looked more expensive and it looked more rich because of your taste. Well, and also the thing that people forget, and I see this in the industry a lot now, is that that they put so much detail and everything's so clean and slick and all that. And there's lots of artists that are really good at that. Um, Ken's paintings were not slick, but, but all the values were there, all the colors were there. You could take that and then when you paint the real background, all the information you need is already there. You don't need all that detail there, you know? And, and I think uh, for our industry, that's gotten kind of lost because everybody, you know, they want to see making of book art and they want to see the wall art and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Why did we not have time to and, do that? <laughs> we didn't, but, but uh, because of, of Ken's uh, talent and um, uh, because of his vast experience, he could just nail those things. So when I took it over to Taiwan, you know, language barrier be gone, everything. It's just like they knew exactly what to do. And so that's, that's pretty cool. I, oh, yes, Daryl. I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the storyboard process for actually coming on to this uh, film. It's been really fun listening to Deanna talk about the voices and you know the music to me is just so much the film, but none of that existed when uh, when we first started boarding. And in my memory, this is my first day. It might not be, but I remember uh, seeing uh, some of the animation tests and Lampian specific, specifically, um, and Jerry saying, this is Lampy, he's, he's, uh, he's a dim bulb. And I went, oh, I got it, yeah. And that was it. And uh, there was no voice, but when the voice came, that was Lampy, it was just the way I felt about it. And it was, it was such a short um, way of talking about things, but the thing that was amazing was that they weren't cartoon characters, they were real, and I think we talked about this. Mm -hmm. This is a real situation. These are real characters, and it's real high stakes for them. And I went, okay, yeah. that's fun. That's fun. It's yeah. not a cartoon, and I never ever thought of it as being anything than other than real characters that were in this Jeopardy and had this goal. So yeah, it's, you know, if you have a character like the the lamp who thinks he's really bright, but he's a little dim. You know, there's something relatable and kind of, yeah, you can be empathetic for that character. And like with Blanky, it's, you know, for a kid, it's a security blanket. Of course, there, there was no kid in the original film. We added that. But as soon as you thought of the blanket being cuddled by a child, it's the security blanket. 
And without the child, it becomes the insecurity blanket. Everything is about being insecure and needing the, the cuddling. And uh, you should have told me that back then. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done something different. Yeah. And, and the vacuum, vacuum whose whose job yeah. is to hold everything inside. Right. That's manufactured to do that. And so this is the thing that was so great was just how compact the descriptions were. Oh, vacuum cleaner holding it in. Got it. Mm -hmm. And this character, and, and it was all really fast. There was very little time wasted. I am speaking of some of the boards, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it out to questions, but I just thought I'd do a couple things real quick is one showing the recent scanning of the storyboards. They were just, by the way, in just in a box. That's like 80% of the film there. And we usually would draw them smaller than that. And those were blow ups of that. And we didn't get any more. Finished. So I put it on a Caesar scanner, which uh, Tina had recommended to me, and it had a foot pedal and auto correction of uh, tilt. So I could go through and do those. So Daryl, this is one of your boards uh, of the flower. And uh, the sad toaster looking back at the wilted flower. So fast we're working. Some of the drawings are like, oh, terrible. <laughs> that's that's one of mine. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't, you know, none of us worked to make them finished. It was what's quickly indicating what the attitude was in the scene, what the relationships were. Uh, so the, these were some of my roughs for the movie, and they didn't even make it past pencil line. They just lay flat, or do you have to, like, put glass over them to get them to lay down? Just totally. a down it's like a down shooter, right? They just lay Scanner. flat on the table, and, uh, yeah, it just auto-corrects. Do you have anything particularly? A little auto correct, like auto correct uh, tilt, yeah, um, wow. and auto crop at the edge. Mm -hmm. But these, uh, and Daryl, again, these are uh, some of yours, I think, for the waterfall scene. So you can see, like every moment, when I would sat with Daryl before it went through the rest of the team, it's like I saw the sequence happening here, and we could do any tweaks in this phase, and then those would be attached to the front of the animators folder. So when they received the scene with a layout in it, it would have all of these poses attached to the front. And, um, no, oh, that was just a, uh, by the way, there was another thing in talking to, uh, to the actors about the attitude for the characters and that it was real. Uh, you know, radio says, why, well, uh, Houdini did this once, why, if I remember right, he was out of the hospital in no time. And uh, Lampy goes, well, that's encouraging, but, but I told him, mean it. D don't, don't, don't understand that it was sarcastic, like, like really be optimistic. So he was like, he meant it when he said that's encouraging. Um, jumping uh, further here, I remember after this scene, Tom Wilhite was at a screening where you know, I timed having the vacuum after everyone else has fallen. It's just frightening that there's that cable and everybody's gone, uh, that he backs out of sight and it's just gone there for a long time. And Tom, Tom used the, the term brave. He said you were, you were very brave <laughs> to let it take that long as a director. Um, but, you know, to me, that was, I wanted to feel that before he committed to jump in. And then all your boards here, Daryl, it's just like animation poses. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, absolutely. I remember this really well. It was a really fun sequence to do. And it was sort of like taking like every two seconds yeah. and, and showing the image, all the, the activity yeah. that was going on and giving the animators work uh, stuff to work with. Yeah, and, and the angles that you know, we're, we committed to the angles that it was it was from this point of view. Um, uh, it's one of my little roughs for that scene. So, yeah, I just laid them out uh, so you could see the the progressive uh, the progression of the of the sequence. But you know, this is how finished we got. That was just in. Uh, you, somebody was asking about what kind of pads we were on. It's just it, we just cut them out. <laughs> there was no pad. But you can really see uh, the intention of the sequence laid out roughly. And then working that fast on this one was an advantage actually because it it demanded people not play with what was going on instead of just get directly to what the scene was about. Mm -hmm. 
and illustrate it as graphically clearly as possible. You know, and the other thing was I'm not trying to make fancy drawings and that, you know, I worked on other things since then when I'm trying to talk people out of spending all the time making drawings and getting instead of getting to the gist of the story is the hardest part of getting things, especially in boarding. Yeah. Way, way back when I was in my teens and mentoring with Eric Larson, he emphasized that with us. He he looked at my early work and I was, I was trying to be really careful to be on model with everything and and he just said that's going to be a problem and i said why it's like i worked so hard and he said don't fall in love with your drawings because the main thing is the idea it's better to go through 20 ideas and find the right idea and don't have fallen in love with any of those drawings after you find the right idea then maybe you could do a pretty drawing so oh and that was the uh that was the taxi driver uh gopher which was was that didn't make it to the final cut was dialogue always written at the bottom of the drawing or do we use scripts not always. Not always. yeah Sometimes it's stripped, sometimes it just stayed on the page. Yeah, but, uh, the thing was missing was like losing the strip that went with the drawing. Sometimes. Yeah, I, you know, I would type things out and then as we handed out the pages, sometimes, you know, people would treat it differently. Sometimes we would just refer to the typed page. Other yeah. times we'd write it on the panel itself. Other times pin it up underneath. Yeah. I've got a whole bunch of those wadded up in the box where the boards were just board panels strip. with dialogue. Yeah. Uh, and this, you know, was uh, me pitching to Jerry, so I would write the dialogue on the bottom yeah. of the, the sketch. Um, I will jump on to, and then I'll turn it over to, to questions. It just will show, I promise to show you the deleted mold scene. So this is one of a number of scenes. I also, I haven't done this yet, but I have the crazy Ernie scene when they actually go meet him at the junkyard. And they ask if he's crazy Ernie, and he's Ernie. But he doesn't like being called crazy, so that becomes a problem. Uh, so part of this sequence with the mole is, as you remember it, uh, so you're going to see stuff where you go, oh, I saw that in the movie, but the mole was an added thing. And just because the movie was getting too long and we had to finish, uh, I had to go through and find like a thousand places to micro edit because Chuck would deal with me like, take out this sequence. And I'm like, no, I have to keep everything, but I'll make everything a little shorter. So. <laughs> So the mole was one of the people, one of the characters that, that left. So here he's going through the, the thicket. And it's getting more dense. And they stop. And then Kirby decides he's going to really do the shag carpet treatment for this. So he gets up his gear and charges into it. Zoom. And he's crackling through that. And they're bracing. And then this is what you don't see in the movie. There's a little hole in the ground. And a mole looks out and zzz, he gets vacuumed and whoop goes uh, right up inside the vacuum. And then he goes, hmm, uh, funny taste in dirt. <laughs> and then he keeps going. So now uh, you hear the mole like, let me out, let me out. And then you continue and they come out and crack through the thicket into the clearing. Crash, he's coughing up a storm. Hey, look, everybody, a clearing. <laughs> and uh, so they start arguing with each other. Great, let's spread it like out and have a picnic. But I'm all full of stickers. And uh, well, my bag's full, full of thistles and sticks and God knows what else. Uh, and, and then, the, you know, whose idea was it come this way anyway? They proceed through that. Well, it was the lamps, I tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he jumps down and confronts him. They have their uh, show down there. Where are we anyway, says Toaster. And uh, why look, he does the uh, Pee Wee Reese is at the plate and does the baseball hit, ping, ping, ping off of their chrome. <laughs> it's a triple play. And then he backs up. And I'm so glad that, that we added the rock because we have Lampy holding a rock, uh, <laughs> which was not in the storyboard. Uh, but Toaster says, you know, knock it off, you guys. Uh, let's all settle down and try to get some sleep. That means you too. Blanket says, but I'm not tired. And then you hear snoring. So uh, Kirby's wondering what that is. It's coming from his bag. And then he freaks out. Benjamin, I, I see we crossed out my guy and put Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> There's something in my bag. <laughs> 
And uh, so he's freaking out, and the bag is uh, making snoring sounds and stuff. So he, he's uh, going one way or another, and he says, get it out, get it out. So Toaster reaches up and zip. Ah. And you see like, oh, Toaster's shocked, Lampy's shocked, Radio's shocked, Blanky's shocked. And then you see the mole stick its... And it comes just slowly waddling out of the bag. And they're just staring at it. And then there's that drawing, I think the Joe sketch that you turn into a t-shirt, mm -hmm. close to that. And then he goes, ah, big yawn, because he's a sleepy mole. And then they look, and then they go, ah, goes blank here. Ah. <laughs> Uh, so then the mole is blink, blink, and then big yawn, and then everybody, ah! <laughs> so uh, finally, you just, hey, cut that out, because it's making everybody yawn. And by the way, Rebecca and I tried that with our cat, and you can make a cat yawn. So, uh, so Toaster looks over, and it's, it's zip pan over, and then you see a hole. It's like freshly dug, there's dirt around it, and then you're from down in the hole, and... Uh, from down in the hole, you see Toaster peek down from above. And that ended the sequence. So, so do you, I, I see there's questions lingering. What, what is going on? Yes, yes, we got um, a question from someone that calls himself Grumpy Vacuum. So I thought we should answer those first to help him out. Grumpy. He's asking, what was the reason behind the casting decision for Kirby? And why is Kirby purple on the VHS cover? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know why he's uh, any color on the VHS cover, because I had nothing to do with the, how that was designed. But I just I loved uh, Thurl Ravenscroft. I just thought he was an amazing voice actor, always in it. It was a dream to get him. So, because a lot of uh, Disney uh, uh, VHS covers have mm -hmm. purple characters. I mean, you think Bell is purple, yeah, yeah, and Bell, it's like yeah, they, yeah. I think there's some marketing thing that says, "Oh, purple, well, purple sells well for children." <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I, I did get that impression, and it's you know, uh, I, again, there's a misunderstanding that a lot of people, and I think it, at Disney home video, they thought we were making a kid's film. None of us, when we were making it, were making a kid's film. We were all in our 20s and we were starving to make something creative. We finally had the chance and we were making a film that we liked as 20 somethings. And our veteran teachers at Disney had made it a point to say they never made a kid's film in their career that they were making movies. And sometimes it appealed to the kid in you as an adult, but they outright said, we never made a kid's film. And we out for op were operating under that same premise. And Randy, I remember you and I were having discussions as we were getting into this about how you could legitimately make an emotionally deep character that looked cartoony. Yeah. Like, and, and our premise was you can. As long as the story and the acting takes you there, the design can be really simple. Uh, so, so it was on our, it was on our minds to reach uh, something that had rich acting with simple looking characters. You know, on the first early, very early version of uh, Roger Rabbit, that was kind of kind of the goal was to take Roger and turn him into a real a character that you really felt he's going through something and is yeah. really doing something. It, the final movie doesn't really have much of that. It became much more wacky, but that was the original concept we were working on, uh, Roger Rabbit. It right. probably came from our discussions. Right. But yeah, the 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 painting with the the sort of noir painting of Toaster is what I painted back in 1987 before we had a screening at the Wadsworth Theater, and it was just a festival screening, and I painted that and put it in the Groundlings Improv Theater lobby to try to draw people to the event. And that's where I was going. I didn't go to like a daycare center or try to get right. something for kids. I went to an improv, LA improv club and put our poster up to try to get people that would come see you guys on stage, come see our film that we made together. And I think because of the name of the film, Seeming Kid, but you have to remember the original novella came from a science fiction author right. who was doing something that was an homage to that kind of film and it was not 
directly a kid's project, even when he wrote the book. Um, but I, I think that the home video approach was to overtly try to label it and market it as a kid's film. And I think the real pastel -y colors and everything were added because they thought that's what they were selling. And in the meantime, I had my noir thing and they're like, they, they didn't like that. <laughs> it was like, but that's what I made. So actually we went out to uh, Sundance Film Festival with the film back when I still had that poster. And we screened and we were looking for distribution, theatrical distribution and Disney had invested in the project and had the right to put it you know, home video out but they had no theatrical rights or merchandising rights. And so we were going there to try to get a distributor, get in theaters, and then we knew its second run would be Disney Channel and home video, and everybody would do well. It's like you get your first uh, exposure out there in the theaters, then you follow through with home video. And a couple of things happened. Uh, one is that several of the judges at Sundance came and met with me and it was it was quite a year. There were a lot of a lot of projects out there, and but we were the only animated thing. And several of the judges took me aside and said, "You know, in private, we agreed that you have the best film here this year. But if we give it to a cartoon, people won't take the festival seriously. We're just getting started, and uh, so just so you know, we really think you have the best film." So, but it's going to somebody else. So I was I had to go to my team and go, you know, they told us that we have the best film. We're not going to get an award, but uh, that's kind of, uh, I, I guess, thank you, I guess. Yep. And, and, then, uh, and then the other thing that happened was, uh, despite that, Skurus Films stepped up to distribute. And at the time they were an art house theater just distribution thing, and they got it. They just said, this is a college and young adult film. We're not even going to do a matinee for families or anything. This is just art house, night movie, date movie. Um, so I went, thank you, you know. And then the Disney Channel moved up their airing, which made Skurus have to back out. So they said, we have to have longer to put in the theaters because they're, they're going to try to show it on Disney Channel first, and that'll kill our theatrical. Um, the lawyer I have now still, uh, I got associated with back in those days because he stepped up at Sundance and said, I'm an entertainment lawyer just starting out. I loved your film. Do you need anything? And I said, yes, I actually do. Uh, and I described the situation and he said, well, I'll go see what I can do. And he came back and said, I, I don't get it because they're devaluing their own product to keep to push it out of the theaters and it would be more valuable to them in the home video market and cable if they let it do the theatrical run first but they but they won't um they're not going to move and uh you know the, the only thing i could figure out and i had i actually had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh with katzenberg at the time too asking him to please cooperate and he you know at the time was rather patronizing and just hey when are we getting your way kid but i said but you are mm -hmm. but uh you know the thing that was possibly causing some of this stuff uh, was, I'll bring this up on the screen, that we were getting reviews like this, Best Animated Film of the Year, uh, LA Weekly, uh, sharper and wittier than anything you'd expect from Disney. The Brave Little Toaster is a real G-rated film that's one intended for general audiences, kids and adults alike. Kids will love the basic story and the, uh, fine animation, adults will enjoy the sly wit. The Brave Little Toaster is crisp and crunchy and will, <laughs> will leave you with a warm glow inside. Um, this one, uh, this was from the Wadsworth Theater Screening. Sometimes they do make cartoons the way they used to. The Brave Little Toaster was enthusiastically received by an audience that was happy to see a film that proved that sometimes they do make cartoons the way they used to with genuinely funny characters and gags that grown-ups enjoy just as much as kids. Uh, so once it was pushed out of the theaters and became something people discovered on the Disney Channel. All those reviews that were competing reviews were suddenly their reviews. So it's like, that was a, hey, look at this Disney thing, it's cool. So I, I think it was a, you know, it was a smart chess move, and, um, but it was heartbreaking. And so I hope that answers 
that in a very long way answers that question that came up. I got a question from Gino Sencia from uh, Young, Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, oh. First of all, they wanted to say happy birthday to Jack Nicholson, who's like 80 something. Yep, Gino and Gino. Oh my God, that's so yes, yes. And, and um, they want to know. Oh, they're asking um, Deanna Oliver. Um, what was the uh, Brave Little Toaster impact on your career? And what was your voice acting career like before and after Brave Little Toaster? Wow. Well, before, where, where do I talk? Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, before Brave Little Toaster, I had done zero voiceover work. That was my first one. So thank you. Um, after that, I did, well, I did a little. I did like a we were talking about Family Dog. I did a character on Family Dog, and but Toaster's my voiceover. That what I what what Dino? Hi Dino. What what happened is I uh, went into writing cartoons rather than performing cartoons, and I, and directing the Groundlings rather than perform. I don't who knows why it just happened. I just enjoyed the writing of the cartoons, mm -hmm. so I uh, I wrote on uh, Animaniacs and. Well, a little bit of Tiny Toons, all of Animaniacs, and then what was after that? Well, recently, Curious George and a new show on PBS, Working Out Wombats, because I, I love my approach to writing. I learned from you, I think, which is I, I try, although you're right, animation has changed. I try, I work from character. It's what you get from the groundlings. What's a great character? You just don't stand and try to be funny and tell jokes. It all came from characters, from your background, from your life. Uh, reality, I love all that stuff, and that's how I direct as well. Anyway, I try to put that in my cartoon writing as well. And then from, oh, in between, I wrote Casper with Sherry Stoner and My Favorite Martian, and the pre, uh, a prequel to Roger Rabbit, but it got shelved. It never got made. Uh, that would have been fun. But anyway, same thing. I just, I love the animation, but I, it became more on the production side, the writing side, rather than the acting side. And I don't know why. I just, maybe I just think I am the toaster and that's it. <laughs> I remember uh, so clearly a moment where we were recording together. When you say I'm the toaster, it just takes me back to this moment where we were doing ensemble recording, but you were done for the day and you were going to come back the next day. And so we said, thank you, Deanna. And I was sitting in with Thurl and Tim, I think Timothy E. Day and stuff, and I was going to continue to feed them lines. So you left the recording room and like a half hour later, I look and you're still sitting through the glass in the engineer's booth with a cup of coffee mm -hmm. at night. I mean, we're going into the wow. evening. And so I came back and I said, Deanna, we, you, you can go. And you went, I know, but I kind of feel responsible for people. I think I'm turning into the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> I that was great. I love that. Yeah. Here's a, 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 a thing and then we'll get to the next question. I thought this was kind of fun. Uh, this is the yin yang of toaster. Uh, it gave me nightmares. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> and uh, this is something and I think it comes out of partly that people thought that they were getting a kids video for their family and they weren't. Uh, Pop culture shock <laughs> rated it as scariest movie ever. <laughs> I've seen it with uh, listed with Psycho and other things as like scariest movie. So, so I'll, I'll take you through a little write up that they did and I'll just read it with you. Um, a bitter, cynical air conditioner channeling Jack Nicholson berates the appliances for awaiting the messianic return of their master who abandoned them in his old rundown cabin. And when they say he's just jealous because he's stuck in the wall, he bursts into a paranoid range. I'm not an invalid. I was designed to stick in a wall. I love being stuck in this stupid wall. Um, <laughs> since this is a happy children's film, what do you think happens next? A, the toaster talks down the air conditioner from his rage spasm and they all learn a valuable lesson about their anger management. Or B, the air conditioner continues to rant and scream until the other appliances walk away in disgust. The answer is C, air conditioner explodes. <laughs> he freaking explodes, showering the other appliances with sparks, which is probably the air conditioner equivalent 
of <laughs> arterial spray. The only thing that could make this scene more traumatizing would be one last shot of the air conditioner lying in pieces and billowing smoke. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Mom decides to pop back in. Is everything all right? I thought I heard the sound of innocence dying. <laughs> now the appliances are bouncing on a pogo stick. Oh! What hilarious hijinks. I'll just leave your impressionable mind alone with the influence of the television now. <laughs> so I thought that was rather fun. But on the flip side, recently, and I just dropped her a note last night. Actually, as I was prepping for this, probably at like two o'clock in the morning. She's in Germany, so I don't know if she got it yet. But she wrote, Fatima wrote an article that came out last November, I believe it was, and she wrote a very long, well thought out thing, and it, her premise was The Brave Little Toaster, why it's one of the best 80s animated films. The Brave Little Toaster is forever acclaimed by its cult following as one of the best, if not the best, animated films of the 1980s. And she has a very long article with a lot of pictures and analysis, and I just really appreciated that. And Carol, I think you sent that to me and also sent me her LinkedIn address, so I Finally, as we were getting close to the, the uh, reunion today, I sent her a link and said, maybe, so maybe she, maybe Fatima, maybe you're watching today. And if so, we thank you. Um, so, other questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. All right, so Zing Graham wants to know, are there any life experiences that impacted the film? And that's for anyone and crew. Uh, well, I... Certainly from a lot of people that have written to us, uh, Rebecca and I have sometimes huddled over fan mail that's come in where they have talked about really meaningful impacts on their lives. Uh, we got, you know, everything from somebody saying my parents got divorced, but watching the film sort of took me through the swamp of that experience and I felt like I could get to the other side. There was somebody that wrote about being in a for a while their family being in a, a homeless shelter and they would occasionally watch the film to get their spirits up and thankfully they got back on their feet um, some some other people that just found a real connection with certain characters like um, you know somebody that said vacuum and the way he held things inside had a breakdown but then was able to finally find peace uh, was meaningful to them in a significant way and we had uh, even some people that contributed fan art tonight, there was there was one who talked about feeling rather suicidal and having the character, the, the, the story of the characters and how they had finally faced adversity and hung together was very therapeutic. And uh, so there's a lot of that. And somebody like uh, Roland Jaffe, who directed the mission in Killing Fields, he told me back in the day that he asked me to come do some story work with him for a while. And he said, you know, you and your team did something I didn't think was possible. I, I as an adult filmmaker, I shed a tear over a cartoon appliance. And, uh, and I think a couple of people have mentioned, Steve, a scene that you worked on where the air conditioner is finally repaired. Because, you know, in his whole first breakdown, it's really, it's on the one hand, he's feeling like cool and above everyone else but also left out and says, you know, I couldn't help it if the master was shoot, too short to reach my dials. I like got part of this is just a, the rage of never being included in, uh, in the fun. And of course we have the years have passed. The kid is tall enough to reach the dials and repairs them. And I remember we talked about that scene and I explained after the first draft where it was a little more, uh, direct, I said, well, this is really a, like free on tears of it being repaired. Like, you know, at last thing it knew it went unconscious with the, you know, being separated uh, and feeling forever not part of the group. And now he's like personally repaired by the master who's gotten big enough to reach in and, and repair everything and get him working again. And as he's cool and the, and the master's grooving on that, he's like feels the wind and it's just this nice thing that as he walks away, you see the air conditioner get the little on tears in its eyes and it's like wow he cared you know so you have somebody like a filmmaker like that say it touched him you know so yeah. well, go ahead. well just a quick real life experience when my son deployed to afghanistan his unit 
uh, tomahawks. Anyway, the, the soldiers brought me toasters to sign. It was just <laughs> And if they didn't have a toaster, they said, sign my lighter. Sign anything. And it was just the sweetest thing they wanted to take. A, now I'm going to cry. I, well, because of that. So just to think that the soldiers wanted to, because this, this is the movie I grew up on. you got to sign my toaster. I'm going to take it to the war. And I thought, mm -hmm. so toaster went to war. Kind of, you know? <laughs> anyway. That's real life. Yeah. That was real life. Well, you know, David was talking earlier about the, you know, how the appliances, there's sort of this maturity that happened or, that he felt at, by the end of the, yeah. the thing. And, and, and I've, I've told you this before, when we got, it was like a parallel to the production as far as, you know, we were all that Taiwan group together, really, you know, working crazy hours. And, and but it was this sort of team or really became family that were, yeah. we were there together yeah. and you got to that last scene and and we were working on it chronologically so you know the end the end scenes were done last yeah and there's that last scene where they're in the back of the car and they're like yeah. we did good didn't we mm -hmm. and it's like yeah we did good and I, and I remember thinking yeah that's us yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. That's well Re Rebecca has mentioned that before we did good, right? We did good. Yeah. Well, and I saw somebody that did a review, a rather raucous review of our film, but they, they seemed to get what we were up to, and they actually said, and I thought this was accurate, they said this film might as well be a story about the filmmakers. You know, it was like the brave little team that went through all these trials and tribulations to get to the end, and they finally made it, you know. So uh, I thought their saying it was kind of autobiographical on our part. Uh, was pretty pretty accurate. I have a great segue after what you just said. Um, so Ellen Woodbury from Colorado uh -huh. um, has a question for the entire crew. Right. So everyone uh, had to be you know had to think and work outside of the box for this project. Uh, did that experience influence the rest of your career in animation? Tell us about it. I, I would say. Immediately for me, yes, and then a lot of people join in that the um, Cliff Notes are, I fell so in love with working with Deanna and Tim and John and Phil and everybody from the Groundlings Improv Theater and did not feel like the improv ability was sort of loose canon territory where it was like not controllable or you couldn't author it. I felt like it was contributed greatly to the depth of characters and the instinct in the moment to bring something alive. So the very next thing that I did was to direct Robin Williams in Back to Neverland. And I remember that was before he was in Aladdin. He was in our short film. And I remember John Musker and Ron Clements talking to Rebecca, who was on the story team with them uh, for, uh, for Aladdin. And they said, oh, what, what is it like for Jerry to work with him? Is he like, is he a loose cannon? And she said, no, they get along great. You should talk to them about it. So um, I just felt like working with all of you with your experience, I, I saw it as an immediate plus, your improv abilities on top of having what's written on the page. You're also an ensemble performance, and you bring new dimensions to it because you have the improv ability on top of that. And that doesn't mean you're always trying to throw lines out. It means you're adding connective tissue, sometimes you're throwing in new things, or sometimes we do shape a scene beyond where it started on the page. Uh, so just taking that immediately into the Robin Williams area, and that, and that was kind of meant a lot to me because we had to fight to use him because they, they were resisting having him get near Disney animation because they described him as a crotch grabbing adult comic with abuse, substance abuse problems. Uh, so my argument was, Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio was voiced by, you know, Ukulele Ike, Cliff Edwards. Uh, ukulele Ike was his stage name, and he worked dirty. You could go buy dirty records of, of Ukulele Ike when Pinocchio was out in the theaters, and he died an alcoholic, but Walt saw the charm that he, he, he had a gift, and he's an amazing Jiminy Cricket. So my argument to them when they were saying, no, not the adult comic with substance abuse problems. I was like, well, you know, it worked for Walt. Yeah. And so they 
begrudgingly sort of skidded towards that and said, well, just it's a short and if it fails, at least we didn't waste much. And at least it's in the parks. It's not part of our canon of Disney animation. So it keeps us okay with the Bible Belt. Um, but then but then people fell in love with Robin and immediately he was welcomed in and he was in Aladdin and a whole bunch of other stuff happened. So I felt like the spirit of adventure and trying things in Toaster directly fed into that. And it was another like, what are you going to do? You're going to cast who and do what? And then it like the dominoes that fell from that. I mean, how many billions have Disney made from Aladdin? It's like, exactly. so it was kind of a good thing. Well, I just want to say hi, Ellen. We share oh, rooms no, that's together. That's Ellen, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ellen Woodburn. We, we shared rooms uh, on Beauty and the Beast yeah. and Aladdin and worked on uh, Lion King together. You know, it's interesting that what, uh, the influence of, of Toaster later in my career, and maybe Kirk, you could speak up to this too, is when we were working on Beauty and the Beast, the, the taking the um, appliances function as a metaphor for their personality was certainly something that then was adapted into the object characters in Beauty and the Beast. We have, you know, Cogs were very tightly wound and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Lumiere was literally flamboyant. Those sort of things, uh, you know, were, were really started and born with this film and worked so well that those things then could be, you know, uh, kind of a, a riffing point for, for later films. And so... Uh, that was kind of a neat thing. And since we had both worked on Toaster, uh, when we started talking about those object characters, it was kind of the first place we went was, okay, well, you know, Mrs. Potts is warm and, you know, uh, buns to pour out for everyone kind of thing. So you get those personality traits uh, that work with the metaphor really nicely. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Well, um, <clears throat> I think uh, it was really important to my career because uh, I met Joe Rampt, and then as I'm sure most people know, he went on to be the head of story at Pixar, and I think he put in a good word with John Lasseter for me to work. I got to work on, on right. Toy Story, and uh, I don't think it would have happened without, without Joe, and it was really great to be able to work with him on both those films. Yeah. I mean, your, your film and John's film. Yeah. Didn't Joe design the Casper? Casper, the movie, the movie Casper. I think Joe Ramp designed the. I'm not sure I'm about that. Sure. I, I, I was, I'm but sure. I was, at, uh, and this is true, it sounds like a joke, but I was a ghostwriter yeah. on Casper <laughs> later on uh, for, for Stephen. But I don't, I don't know. I think Joe who designed. Did, some, uh, did the, the animated design? Yeah, okay. design Casper and the. Uh, the Fatso and Stinky or Stinky. Oh, <laughs> All the, the Ghostly Trio, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to, to what Brian said. Uh, 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 me and uh, Kevin Lima and Steve Moore, um, this was uh, one of our first, if not the first, uh, job that we had uh, graduating Cal Arts, and it was hugely. Uh, impactful, I think, on on all of our future careers. Um, um, you know, both me, uh, me, Kevin, and Steve all all went on to become directors ourselves. And I think all of us credit you, Jerry, so much with being our first role model for what is a director and what does a director do. And and um, what you modeled so well for us was uh, uh, how inclusive you were. It, it, you had a vision for the movie. You were, very, you were very protective of that vision, yet you allowed your team to flourish. You, 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 uh, uh, you welcomed collaboration and, and welcomed people building on, on the foundation that you had created. And I never forgot that. And I took that with me. Um, um, as, as, you know, my career progressed and, and, you know, I have always looked back on that experience as, as it's like, if, if, <laughs> um, the other thing that you modeled I, for me particularly well was, was a, a calm and quiet, uh, uh <laughs> determination, um, that, that, you know, was unflagging in the face of, of, 
you know, angry executives. <laughs> and that was a variable, very valuable lesson for me. <laughs> One or two. <laughs> never, never heard of scene being real. Yes. Well, I, that means so much to me. I, I truly appreciate that. I, I I always felt like everybody in the team was so important to what we were doing all the time. And you know, I asked uh, many of you to wear multiple hats. So instead of this thing of you belong there and you belong there, it was like, hey, can we, can you do two things? Can you do three things? Can you do four things? It was like, Chuck did effects animation and, and extra voices too. And, uh, and, but I, that was valuable. I always have felt like, that's right. Well, I, yes, I'm actually six months in the hole on the film, but, uh, so I feel, I feel your angst, but, uh, yeah, I always felt like, like people were so capable of contributing every day and that it was just, everything would get more creative and more exciting day by day when we'd be doing these brainstorm sessions. And it's like, well, here's the scene. And it, we weren't going to like zigzag into like another purpose for the scene, but like, hey, the purpose can be more clear or there can be another layer of charm that's introduced into the scene beyond what was there. And, uh, and Alex, I remember you really taking on a lot of the sort of the heartfelt moments uh, with characters. And I remember like having conversations with you where you, you took it on yourself to try to make sure we always cared about the characters and why we're spending time with them and everything. And just each one of you had some special thing that you would bring to it. And I, you know, so I would always feel like the more people feel their own fingerprint on a work of art, the more they can be proud of it as a team later when looking back. That's one of the things I really enjoyed working. You would be at your K-Pro. Yes. <laughs> and you, you know, we'd see you through the glass window and you'd be generating text. But by the time Joe and I and Daryl got a hold of it, it was alive and we were able to start to find subtext yep. and find moments that weren't in your original text. Mm -hmm. And you were open to that. No, absolutely. Which was refreshing. Yes, well, it, I, character lives. I, I, I'm even now doing things like dealing with artificial intelligent conversational characters and things. I go to them, and a lot of those projects start with them thinking the text is it, like AI is text to speech. And I would go, what is a character doing when there's no text? When you're talking and there's three characters just listening to you, who are they? Are they interested in what you're saying or bored or are they nervous about what you're saying or excited that there's all this stuff that's ignored just in service of only what's being said. And so the behavior around what's being said is where a lot of a character comes alive. And so starting that, like seeding those scenes, I was fully expecting you to play in that arena. I had the great opportunity of studying with Alexander McKendrick mm -hmm. at Cal Arts, And he would spend a whole lecture talking about the pre-verbal language of cinema. Mm -hmm. And yes. so much of that is lost these yeah. days. Uh, and, and, you know, things where there aren't, isn't dialogue or where dialogue and action tell you two layers where it gives you dialogue and yeah. gives you rich or, or counterpoint. A character could be telling you, oh, I'm perfectly fine. Why did you ask? But you see them doing a nervous fidget and you realize, oh, they're lying to me. Right. They're actually not fine. So the dialogue and the contradictory behavior together yeah. tell you more than just the dialogue could or just the action could. It's like, like so. Like he goes, I'm not scared. Oh, <laughs> well, actually, that was a beautiful moment. That's a great example. They're sinking in the swamp. And Timothy, you know, E. Day in doing the voice was trying to get a handle on this. There was a scary thing, but he's saying, I'm not scared. And I, I explained to him the reason you're saying that is you you actually are terrified. But poor Toaster, like she's desperate for you to be saved and is telling you to untie yourself and everything. And the reason you say that is because you don't want her to feel bad when you die, you know? 
Um, so he was saying, I'm not scared, meaning I'm helping you feel better as we die, you know? So that was true. And, and he put that, he put that emotion in, in yeah, his voice. Good stuff. Um, any other? Yes, uh, you're talking about the swamp scene and uh, Dino Sensia from Ohio again. Um, they want to know why there's so many Toy Story parallels uh, um, in Brave Little Toaster. They said that they know that uh, Brave Little Toaster came out before and John Laster worked on Brave Little Toaster. And so they're wondering what happened. You know? well, it, well, he didn't work on the version of Brave Little Toaster that you see. He was going to make another film, and that was when Will Height said, "This would be an interesting short, but it's people are telling me it's not a feature." So he left his involvement with that. I never collaborated with him after that, uh, although we remained good friends and everything. But I, we didn't uh, collaborate on the film. So I came in cold and read the book fresh and worked with Brian and Joe, and we just changed a lot of things that were not in the book and then were not in the Lasseter development at all. So the junkyard was in the middle. Brian had this beautiful artwork of the junkyard that came in the middle of the story. One of my first things was, oh my God, the, you, this is such a powerful thing. This is the graveyard, this goes to the end. This should be where they end up if they don't aren't successful. That's where you go to die if you're an appliance. So that was a big shove. Defining who the characters were individually, which Daryl was talking about, um, had not been done. So we went through and said, who are all these characters? The master in those two things in the book and the early development, it was somebody had abandoned them. And I didn't like that person. So I went, I, I would like to like this master. So if it was a, the kid of a family that they bonded with, the kid's not to blame if they move away. So that was not in any of the previous stuff. Showing the kid growing up, gave you a passage of time and could then let you know how long they've been in this plight. So that was a, a plus that came out of that was in neither of the two things earlier. And then at the, the junkyard finale to say that master, the kid that's grown up, who was not in either of the two things is now in our story, trying to find them in the junkyard and is almost killed. And now for the first time that was never in any of those early developments, Toaster itself has a moment to be brave, where it actually throws itself in gears to save the master. So that whole scene, the character, the moment of bravely, like none of that was in any of the previous incarnations. Um, so that was born in our version with our team after Disney, after Lasseter, and before Toy Story. So however much they wanted to echo or refer or take with them into their film, I leave it to other people to discuss but i didn't inherit any of that from disney or lasseter it was something that we did together joe, did, joe was joe, working with john on joe, the early version yes of joe and, and brian and joe and yeah. I, oh, joe and I oh yeah that's right so i remember so I, 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 years ago. and i celebrated joe and brian coming in and continuing to work but we just worked on a new version oh, yeah. of the story um but yes joe was a connective tissue that after he came and worked with us. And my first thing was four weeks, and, and I have the original schedule that we wrote out. The first four weeks was Joe and me in a room with index cards to work on story for, for four weeks to get all this new stuff set up. Brian was just such a contributor. I added him to the story by list. Um, and the, also the, the producers were just gonna have me a sole writer. And I just said, I, I feel like Joe has contributed so much that I must put him in as co-writer. So, but it just grew out of that fresh endeavor. And yes, then Joe became, after, after having gone through that, he went to Pixar and I'm sure continued to be a similar influence with them. He was, he's just always magical. I think and having, uh, having worked on the earlier version of Toaster at Disney with Joe and John. John originally, I should take this off while I'm talking. Um, John originally wanted to make Toaster with computer graphics. Uh, it was so early on in computer graphics that it was certainly not going to be possible to do at that point, but that was sort of uh, John Lasseter's goal with it. And so I think uh, 
you know, my interpretation of why there are a lot of similarities in Toy Story is that John get, didn't get to do them on Brave Little Toaster. So when he got Toy Story, it was his kind of wish fulfillment to do some of the things he wanted to do on Brave Little Toaster uh, on, in Toy Story. So I think that's where some of that comes from. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. One quick thought. Uh, it does seem like Lampy looks and moves a lot like Luxo Jr. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, Lampy, Lampy was pre Luxo, so uh, yeah. yeah. So and, and and Rebecca had a lot to do with how Lampy moves. She did so the early. Getting roses up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you write a letter. Stronger. Yeah, you're a little bit. You're in the logo. <laughs> so that's some of that you can probably chalk up to you know if you have if you have this lamp shape and you're an animator and you're trying to figure out yeah. how to design a locomotion for this particular shape mm -hmm. two two options. animators will will likely come to similar conclusions yeah. so so you know that that's more what i would chalk up the similarity yeah. between those two characters yeah it's just you know occasionally i'll hear something like well you know They'll talk about the junkyard finale and the toaster throwing itself in. And as I was saying, that was not the finale in the original story. So it's not like that was that's how he would have done the finale. This is how I did the finale. It's like, no, there was a different finale. It was a whole held together different thing. But um, it was really interesting. The the worthless, you know, people are talking. And David talked about the the song worthless and 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 just the whole trash compactor thing that constituted the the finale uh it was interesting that van dyke parks when he was working collaborating on songs uh, that was it was interesting that you know people have really connected with that as being a sort of a powerful piece with the each character singing about its imminent demise and and it gets crushed and everything um but it, that almost didn't happen there was a there was a song that came back to me. It was the only one of Van Dyke's that I went to Tom Willite and said I, I can't use this. It was a sort of a love ballad, and it was intended to sort of be while they're in the junkyard and the master's not seeing them. It's kind of a wistful love ballad kind of thing that plays during that. And actually, and I won't name the person because I don't want them to get in trouble. But I. Had somebody come back from a party and tell me that they had overheard a discussion where he was telling them yeah i'm working with this young director and you know I'm, I'm doing this cool ballad i've always wanted to do and you know uh so i'm happy i get to do my love ballad and he'll think it's for the movie and uh no, no one's the wiser and uh so i i went to tom and just said this doesn't fulfill the story function and i you know i've said yes to everything else from him and i've loved collaborated with him this one's really off the mark, A, when I listen to it, and B, I've heard the story to back up that this is sort of a sidebar effort, not really an effort for the film. So Tom said, okay, I get it. So we went back to Van Dyke and I was able to tell him, I really need something that is inside of our story, driving this thing, not sort of an overlay of wistfulness uh, of the ships that pass in the night or whatever. Um, and he nailed it, he just nailed it with, worthless um and it just was it was a i don't know if he felt extra juice because it was like how dare you say no to something i'm gonna i'm gonna get a great big yes out of you next time uh but it's just it was intriguing to me that that song that so many people now cite that as a, a you know something that is powerful and unusual and uh it was great that that sort of came out of that him after after I had said no to the softer thing and he just went dynamic after that and and it was great and it was so fun to work with actually Ollie Johnson's son was part of an audio team that was doing early experiments before digital was a thing to do sound effects music and morphing audio and so they did the trash compactor sounds that were kind of musical that became the percussion bed for that song so I was working with Ali Johnson's son doing audio crafting for not only the Meadow musical sounds, but the trash compactor stuff. And then David and, and 
uh, you know, Van Dyke obviously for the songwriting and then David Newman for the arrangement of all of that and making all the sound fit together as one big performance. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Being a smaller independent film, I was wondering if there was any feedback from the studio that you pushed back on and kept your vision on? Was there anything that they were trying to change? Any suggestions? And you're like, nope, this is the movie I want to make. Uh, there was, well, there was no studio involvement, thankfully. <laughs> it was just um, Tom Wilhite had taken it away from the studio. And so I was dealing directly with them. And Tom had gave him, given me that promise of creative freedom going into it. And he really stuck to it. There was, there was one crisis moment, though. Uh, where it was not, we didn't, you know, I didn't have to deal with notes coming from them or whatever. Um, but there was word came to me from my editor, who had spent six months with him in the US and then had gone to Taiwan for six months and then came back and did six months of finishing. And word came to me when we were pretty deep into it that Don Ernst, who bless his heart, just uh, passed away recently within the last week. He was my editor. And he said, there's, you know, you have multiple producers, a couple of them are in my editing room trying to chop off the beginning of the movie. They want to start at the waterfall. They don't care about any of the stuff before the waterfall. They just want to start with an action movie. Um, so I flew back to the, to the US, to LA to confront them over that. And that was a, you know, a big waste of time and money to go take a detour during an intense schedule production. Uh, and then, then, you know, went back and then also went back for, for retakes after that. But uh, that, that was an intense thing, but it was not a traditional, there was no like committee giving notes. There was just a couple of rogue producers trying to convince my editor to do like a mutiny. <laughs> but, 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 but Tom was the point person. He was the first person that invited me and he, he knew I had been really starving to do something creative and we'd been working together at the studio and then Brad Bird and I had spent five years trying to get the spirit off the ground, Will Eisner's The Spirit as an animated feature with Gary Kurtz, who was the producer of Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back at the time, uh, as our producer. And we all were dedicated to that and just saw it as a radical thing and it was going to be the first digitally inked and painted film back in 82. I was just coming off of Tron and was pushing to have to be the first ones to break through on that before before Disney and stuff. But a lot of that did not come to pass. Ultimately, after five years, finally, we decided, okay, we're gonna have to hit the pause button, come back later if there's funding, but for now, go find something else. And as soon as I was had resigned from that situation with Gary, uh, with all good feelings, said, look, if we get the spirit going, I'm back in a heartbeat. But as soon as I stepped away, Will Height was the one who called me and had me down in L.A. like three days later and uh, just said, I have this task. And uh, I know you've been starving to do a film and you spent five years trying to get this one off the ground. Well, you, even though I have very little money to give you, I can give you the creative freedom you've been starving for and I'll protect you. And he really, he really did. The other thing, well, the other half of Tom Wilhite was teamed up with uh, Willard Carroll. Okay. No, no, it was no. with uh, uh, Donald, Kushner. Donald Kushner. And their company, they were making uh, Divorce Court. Well, so, first and Ten. And first and Ten, and like these kind of, those kind of shows hadn't, I think they had been peripherally involved in some animated stuff, but they really didn't know. I mean, it was obvious to all of us because none of us had done the jobs we were hired to do ever before. Uh, so anybody who knew what they were doing would never have let us do what we were doing. <laughs> and and so, uh, so that was the kind of interesting thing. Like at one point, well, just as an example, because um, uh, uh, the uh, charcoal sketches are over there that I had done early on, one of the executive producers who shall remain nameless came into my room <laughs> And started yelling at me, uh, looking at those drawings. He's going, "What? What are you doing? What are you doing?" And I'm going, "I. What do you? What? 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 What are you yelling at me for?" He goes, "We're not making this movie in black and white." <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the level we were dealing at. 
but they really didn't come around very much. And um, you know, I think I think in a, in a way for all of us working on it, it was kind of like, you know, if if you want to go get in shape and you you go to like a boot camp and they like like you know work the hell out of you, and then you come out and you're all buff. Toaster was kind of like that for us. <laughs> and I think the proof is in the pudding. You know, you look at all the people that were on it and everybody went on to be, you know, lead something somewhere, you know, either directing or for me, you know, art directing, you know, uh, pictures at bigger studios and things like that. So uh, it really was kind of like that for us. But um, if anybody had known what we didn't know, we would have never been allowed to do what we did. <laughs> we didn't know what we didn't know. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's a great example of why, if you want to work in maybe all industries, but especially in Hollywood, the best place to be is always on the periphery because they leave you alone. Yes. They don't bother with you because you're not important and you're not a star and you're not any of all this other kinds of things and you can get get away with a lot of stuff that you'd never get away with any place else. Yeah. Yep. And I've always loved sort of to try to find boutique, smaller size situations uh, that kind of addicted me to that thing. So, uh, you know, on Toaster, um, it there was so much learning. I mean, you had to produce, but you were, it's like learning, producing, teaching, learning, producing, teaching. It was this, this cycle and it was all happening so fast and condensed. But coming out of Toaster, anything I had worked on to animate or whatever job I was doing on the film, but specifically with animation, I could do it so quickly. Um, much quicker than I could before. And I could just zero in on a scene and know exactly what had to be done and how long it was going to take. And um, it, it just, everything was rapid. And I was very much appreciated by uh, the directors or producers to say, thank you for producing and we're paying you money and you're giving us you know, um, the work that we need. Um, so anyway, uh, and I think Steve, you felt that way too, that you could go into a production and just just glide through, um, you know, yeah. rather than... Just, just do it. And yeah. you know, that's what it, it, it happened on Toaster. You know, you, you just, you do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but you, you, you need this... that with you wherever else you go. Well, because at a certain always point, have that. you have to let go of your fear. You know, yeah. because you don't have time to be afraid. Well, when, when well that, was a, that was a big thing. I know sometimes I would get very self-conscious about what I was going to draw. But as soon as you put that, that huge deadline and just go, you have to have so much done. You can't worry about each drawing. Just go. Um, and it would be so freeing. And I remember Peter Schneider and Jeffrey Katzenberg calling me in after Toaster to ask me how we did it. Like, how much? Because they were astonished by this tiny budget and how much our group accomplished and and how much quality footage came out per day um even though you know we weren't competing directly with their style at all but they they were just asking how and so i was trying to explain you know it's like when you're out of that nitpicky environment where people are poking and prodding and testing and screening a thousand times and changing things and having different opinions and it's just a small boutique team and everybody has uh, an eye on the prize and we're working together and collaborating and plussing each other's work um it just it can happen and it's i think it's also critical on in this team i look around at all of you um every one of you contributed individually it's and i think that's something that's hard for big studios to understand they go we need this many animators of this type, we need this many assistants, we need this many, and I'm like, no, we need Rebecca, and we need Daryl, we need Steve, we need Kirk, we need Deanna. And it's like, it's not just fill in a slot with a type of person and you get the job done. You can fill in those same slots with all different kinds of people and get very different results. So handpicking your team individually is a real plus. And I, I'm not sure that big studio, uh, you know, thinking, I'm not sure if they fully grasp that, but Anybody that's worked on small teams, I'm sure you get that. Well, 
the big features you know, worked on some of the bigger features and then and and they work things to death you know where you you know you do it and and okay you, first time around you, you didn't get something right second time okay you fix that you fix that but after three or four jabs at it, it you got it you know when you've got it mm -hmm. and then they just continue to yeah. you know there's somebody up this there's this always this the brain trust they literally call it the brain trust and it goes from the director to some mysterious brain trust that you know when you're a board artist you don't ever speak of the brain trust and, mm -hmm. and and they just throw everything out and it becomes this sort of creative taffy pull well and something that i think is a real plague with things taking as long as they do is and this is hard to do even when you're doing something fast but really hard when things take so many years is when an idea is fresh you all feel it and then you have to work hard to get it done so you're going to see that same joke 500 times and like by the third hundred time you're like it's not quite as funny and by the end you're like what a boring let's find another joke and it's like and now you start fiddling and you're finding another joke because you don't think it's funny anymore and you go you know what the first one really did fit way better but you don't have that perspective anymore so you know i've always I, I thankfully I think I'm the kind of person that can listen if I enjoy something the first time you know when I listen to the 800th time I still feel that first tickle of like yeah it's still fun instead of going oh I'm now I'm bored let's do something else uh, then it's change for change sake it's not change for plussing it but it's also good to be open that even though you've got your eye on the prize and you want to keep stay on target to be open that sometimes something will come along where you go, it actually will plus it. If I'm honest with myself, that pluses it. So like, be ready to welcome that too, so. Deanna, would you be, would you be up for a cold read I'm on far, something far, I put on the screen? The city of light, wait, what? <laughs> would, you, would you be up for a cold read of oh, something sure. I put on the screen? Cause I just think right. out of your voice, it would be great. This, uh, just a preamble. I. Um, and you can position your chair in a better position to see it if you want. Um, I just, I, I'm just going to end with this little thing. It's a little hint. Uh, uh, I put a website up called Reflections of a Toaster several years ago. I was just musing about if the characters were going on with a, another adventure. Uh, I devised a theme around home being an important thing. And this is just the last two pages of a musing I did with the characters there at at night on this journey they're on their their next adventure and they've had this quiet moment around uh, uh, just as they're bedding down for the night and toaster's voice reading this would be really cool it's just two pages oh the whole thing okay yeah it was a magic moment and a moment in which all I shifted from this unexpected symbol of home to the one who was leading them home now toaster they were looking to toaster for warmth and maybe for a reflection of their own feelings toaster gave the simplest but deepest answer of all home is the only place in the whole world where you can see every member of the family reflected in your chrome at the same time if that happens at least once a day you know everything is good everyone agreed with this wholeheartedly and laptop at it I'm taking this all down, please go on. <laughs> Toaster paused, thinking itself mostly done, then glancing round at its tender dependence, felt a phantom glow in its coils, even though they weren't plugged in. And happy for its companions and for us, a few more warm and toasty thoughts popped up. Some say that home is a thing of the past, the reflection of a lost dream. But I believe that it will always be clear to us. Home means warmth, and warmth is my function. And so to home I offer a toast. Wheat toast with butter and jam. <laughs> toast with butter and jam, everyone cheered. Outside, they heard the beaver slap its tail on the water again, spooked by their noise. They all burst out laughing, which soon turned into yawns, which soon turned into snores, except for laptop who was posting Toaster's last comments on its blog. Being months out of date, the computer was intent on making what could be its final posts meaningful, possibly even worthy of likes and shares. This entry, it thought, measured up. 
While I was spell checking and double checking that the thesaurus had been duly used for flourishes and flavor, a chirping of crickets and fog frogs echoed from beyond the stacked plastic igloo and night fully fell. Signing off, Laptop was struck with a fundamentally chilling thought. Imagining a world with no home pages. What a horrid future that would be. They had to succeed. They had to save it. Home. Yep. All right. So I if any anybody else has questions, I'm happy to continue, but it's kind of a nice bow on it. Go ahead. Yes. One more question. Last question. Yes, last question. Um, for the young, aspiring indie animators and filmmakers out there, um, they want tips, advice, yeah. how to do it. What do you, you know? Gosh, uh, make, make sure that you're doing something you care about. And I, I think I, I've actually had this discussion with teams on all different kind of teams in like theme park projects, uh, independent live action film projects, uh, tech teams. If you know, sit down as a little group and you go, let's try to do our best work ever. And while we're doing it, let's think of 10 years looking back on what we're doing right now and make sure we're proud of it. Like if, if you kind of have that mindset going in for yourself and for teams around you, it really sets you on a different kind of path than if you're doing the chat box of, you know, just will it be a certain thing that's popular right this week or will it make an x amount of money if i do this by next tuesday or something uh it's it's more of a you know a longer term value judgment you're making to, to try to do your best and have it be something you're proud of so and that you know that and then you dig into what you really care about and usually what happens if you really care other people will notice it and you know we had our teachers you know the the nine old men the those of them that were there there were a few of them still at their desk when i first went into my teens and they would say that they went you know we didn't focus test something to find out if it would work like we cared about it and they said if if, if you love something you have proof somebody does if you don't and you go, yeah, but tests show that somebody might love it, you, you don't really have proof of anything. But if you feel it in you, you have proof of one. So like do that. Jerry, mm -hmm. okay, one, thing. one thing that you always did, and I'd say to these young filmmakers, mm -hmm. is that everything grew out of character. Yeah. And there was a story with a premise mm -hmm. and it grew out of character. Yeah. And we never tried to reach with all due respect to all the great work that you did, which was so vital to the movie, but we never reached for the visual as an answer for the dramatic solution. It happened sometime, mm -hmm. but it came out of the bedrock yeah. of character yeah. and understanding that. And then so much I noticed in some of my teaching exploits is that young animators are always trying to reach for the visual. Mm -hmm. And there's no understanding of the backstory or the character or the premise or who they are, all that great stuff you said about how Jerry, you know, said Lampy, what did you say? Lampy is, I'm a little tired right now. You have to forgive me. Yeah. And was that, that's succinct. And it's that kind of thing that I think young animators and story people really need to focus on and you'll get to the visual. Well, and you know what, Alex? And it will become a marriage of the two. And you're right. It will, it will actually influence the visual. If Absolutely. You, if you, if you reach the emotional core first, then, you'll, then you'll know it. how the visual should frame that. Exactly. If you do the frame first, it's like, how do you know what fits in it? Exactly. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how much it's that way in the industry. I, I, I know. They're reaching for cool visuals I, I, and executives will come in and say, oh, there's all these cool visuals. We must really a have a great project here. But they have an immature project, right, Alex? What's that? Isn't it an immature project if it, if it relies on the visual first, I think? Yeah, Yeah, because the, the visual is vital. Well, it's not but, fully formed. 
Right, exactly. Because then they, yeah, then they say, well, now we have to figure out what the story is now. Yeah. And we know how it looks. And we've been having immature stories probably for the last two, three years now. And things that just, I don't see the breadth of life experience creating a thing broad enough to, to, to entertain enough people. Well, you know, I, and I, I like what you're saying about life experience because that's something that we were taught and we definitely tried to do is observe instead of just copying other people's work. Yeah. And you know, the veterans would say that, I, like I'm flattered that you checked out the original drawings from that scene I did in Pinocchio <laughs> and flipped it, but please don't copy me. You know, I, I wasn't copying another animator. I was looking at real life and I was looking at friends and we, you know, when Willie was gonna animate the lightning for that scene, we were, came outside of a bar and like he laid in the rain and was watching the lightning and then the next day he was doing you know charcoal sketches of it they would say reach into your own life your own experience look around you bring that into your work instead of bring other other people's films into your films bring life into your films well this has been absolutely amazing thank you so much thank you so much well this has been absolutely amazing i'd like to ask everyone to help me thank these people <laughs> Yeah. We've got wine, we've got, right you there. can stay and talk, right we're going to shut down online. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye everyone online. Bye. 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 Bye.